Good afternoon. The hour of 12.15, having arrived at Santa Cruz the City Council for the meeting of June 13, 2023, is in session. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Um, Bruner? Present. Council Member Kalantari Johnson is absent today. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Quorum having been established, we'll move on. Presiding officer's announcements, we have none today. Statement of disqualification. This will be the opportunity for a council member to make a statement of disqualification on any items. Council member Bruner. Um, uh, item number 24 on the public consent, uh, consent public hearings, downtown association parking and business improvement area assessments for fiscal year 2024 mm -hmm. um, as that relates to my employment. Okay. Thank you. Other statements of disqualification? Seeing hearing none. Thank you very much. See if there are additions and deletions to the agenda. Ms. Bush, we have any addition? We have none. Thank you. City Attorney report on closed session. Good afternoon, Mr. Condotti. Good afternoon, Mayor. Keeley and members of the City Council. This afternoon, the Council met in closed session in the Courtyard Conference Room with uh, uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson absent uh, at 10 a.m. The following items were discussed. There was one item of real property negotiations involving city-owned property of approximately 8.15 acres in the city of Scotts Valley, APNs 022-72107, and 09. Council received a report from its real property negotiator uh, and gave direction on that item. Item two, liability claims. The claims of Dominique Townsend, Michael B. Smith, and Jenea Kelly were discussed in closed session. Those are also listed on your consent calendar this afternoon for council action. One item of significant exposure to litigation uh, involving one potential case. Uh, council received a report from the city attorney's office on that matter. Uh, there were also five pending litigation items. Uh, the matter entitled City of Santa Cruz versus the Regents of the University of California, currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Second matter was the Regents of the University of California versus the City of Santa Cruz, also currently pending in the uh, Actually, that item is pending in the 6th Appellate District Court of Appeal. Item three is the case of Lisa Foster versus the City of Santa Cruz. Item four is the case of Robert Fleck versus the City of Santa Cruz. In both of those actions, the council authorized the city attorney's office to file cross complaints related to those cases. The details and particulars of the cross complaints will be available to members of the public uh, on request uh, when the uh, when the cross complaints are filed. Lastly, the city received a report on the case City of Arcata versus Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Um, there was no reportable action on that item. Thank you, sir. We are on item five. This is a capital investment program presentation. Ms. Campbell, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Good Council afternoon. Members. Um, Elizabeth Cabell, um, Finance Director. Yeah. Oh, do I have a clicker? Oh. So today we're coming back to um, discuss the capital investment program that we continued from the budget hearings back in May. Um, to start with, um, I, I'll go ahead and kind of kick things off as far as the general fund and and how things um, are looking. That We talked a little bit about how we're changing the way we're doing the general fund piece for fiscal year 24, um, but I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. And then each department will be will come up to actually talk about their specific projects for the upcoming year. So this year we talked about what we've done in the past is we have allocated $5 million from the general fund over to the CIP fund to support different projects. This year for 24, we decided just for one year only 
to put a pause on that and to give us a chance to really go down and look in a little bit more detail at a lot of the projects, or every project if we can. Um, and part of the idea being just to have some extra eyes on it, but also we're in the middle of doing our long range financial plan. That's a significant portion of that. So we really did try and just let's take a pause for a year really look at the projects, kind of prioritize where they are, and plan for the future, plan for what we want to do next. So in doing that, we took into consideration lots of different things as far as where projects are, and it's not just about you know, the completion or not completion, but we looked at staffing levels. Do we have, do the departments have adequate staffing to be able to complete the project? Resources, there's been lots of um, supply chain issues and things like that, so do we, are we able to get the materials and supplies that we need? Funding, we um, also asked departments to sort of look at other funding sources. If it's a general fund project, might there be a grant or another funding source? So sort of just really looking at not just the expense side of things, but do we have other options for funding that particular project? And then again, kind of keeping in mind the long-range financial plan. How does it fit into the, our long-range um, goals for the capital investment program? So as far as that process, pause, prioritize, and plan, where are we? Right now, we've gone through the process of reviewing the projects. It's kind of an ongoing thing, but we've done the first level of looking at all of the projects. Projects that are complete, we've closed them, and any leftover funds that were in the project, we've kind of moved those back over. We've, we've reallocated those to other projects. We've also looked at projects that are maybe got started, for whatever reason, are not moving forward. And the same thing, we've gone ahead and kind of freed up that, those allocations and reallocated it to projects that are going to move forward. Um, and then we asked departments to go through and look at the projects and make a prioritize things that need to start before the end of the calendar year and those things that can start after the calendar year. And so as part of that process, where this brings us to today, so what we're doing today is we are we're going to be looking at the projects that are part of that need to start before December 31st group. And then we're also going to be looking at the projects that are um, the projects that are unfunded and then things that are going to start in December or January of 24, we'll be bringing back at mid-year. So that's sort of the plan for today and moving forward. And just to sort of throw some numbers here. Our CIP program is quite large. This encompasses this 150 million here is everything. It's our general CIP, it's water, it's all of our enterprise funds, there's some special revenue funds in there as well. So this is what is proposed for fiscal year 24. This does not take into account things that are being carried forward. We have lots of projects that are ongoing. So our capital investment program is an ongoing multi-year project program. So this is really just things that we expect to start in fiscal year 24, and then there will be a, the additional things that will carry forward. That's it for my piece. So now I will turn it over to um, Nathan for the Public Works portion. Good afternoon, Mr. Nguyen. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, Council Members. Nathan Nguyen, Director of Public Works. I'm here to go over the uh, CIP Capital Investment Program five-year plan with, uh, uh, within Public Works. Uh, next slide, Bonnie. So within our program, we have over 100 projects that really total over about $250 million. Again, our CIP is a five-year plan, and so we're including uh, all of those projects. Roughly about $60 million of that is grant-funded. And we, in Public Works, we have nine different uh, categories, so to speak, that we, overview, that we have overview for. And so those are listed for you uh, right there on that slide. Next slide. Okay. So... <clears throat> this is really the kind of the meat and potatoes of what Public Works does. So we put them into three buckets for you, um, for, for Council and the Mayor here. So with regards to construction, these are some of the projects that we are seeing that are going to be proposed in construction in fiscal 24. Um, as you can see, the rail trail project is currently underway, and we plan to have that uh, complete by end of this year. Uh, the culvert project was about 95% complete. You guys may have... Uh, uh, Council, you may have seen that uh, last year. We hope to have that complete by uh, later this um, uh, fall when the tides get lower. Um, <clears throat> there's also paving projects that have been approved uh, that came have come before Council, you and the Mayor, in this past year with regards to approval. So those are going to be going into construction uh, later this fall uh, and, and uh, over the winter there. Um, we have some other projects, too, that we're uh, moving forward that we're really excited about. 
the Bay Street protected bike lanes, that is out to bid. We're waiting to getting a contractor to get that started. Hopefully we can have that go into construction this fall. And then there's a, a few other projects that are listed on there that are grant funded, our highway safety improvement, crossing improvement projects, uh, that's also out to bid. Um, we have a vehicle detection project that's also out to bid. We are waiting on getting a contractor set up for that. And of course, the big one that um, we're all waiting to hear for is the Murray Street Bridge retrofit project. Uh, we, still still, we are still anticipating taking that out to bid uh, later this summer. And so when we get the permits all in place, uh, staff will bring back to the council and you mayor uh, approval of moving that project uh, into construction. We'll be working with our, also with our partner agencies with regards to the impacts of that project, including RTC and the county as they look at their uh, large projects that are also uh, underway. Uh, moving on to the next bucket there is design. So, of course, these aren't all the projects that I mentioned earlier, over the 100 that we have in our CIP, but these are some of the larger projects that we're focused on this upcoming uh, fiscal year. Um, you'll see that the wastewater treatment facility has an electrical upgrade project, uh, again, multi-year, um, likely at the price tag currently at $40 million, and we'll see how that translates over these next few years as you know, prices escalate and as we move forward with uh, past the concept design. Uh, the downtown pump station improvement project, uh, that project is uh, currently underway. We're doing an assessment for that. We applied for a FEMA brick grant for $15 million with a local match of $2 million on that project. Uh, segments eight and nine, also currently underway. I believe in our last presentation uh, to council on our budget, we mentioned this project um, as a priority, or we may have missed it as a priority. It's still a priority. We are working on this project, of course, uh, with the EIR being approved, but getting uh, mitigations and permits in place over this next year will be the focus of that project. And then the downtown intersection improvement project, um, that was brought to council in uh, last year as far as the striping concept plan. Um, we are revisiting that with Metro. We are trying to work with them as far as trying to make improvements to Front Street as far as um, potentially a dedicated bus lane. You'll, we're exploring some additional ideas, so uh, that project most likely will be coming back to uh, Council and the Mayor to you later this upcoming year, so we're on that to come. Uh, the, down, the Swanton Delaware Multi-Use Path Project, really excited about that project, grant funded, fully grant funded, you know, $3 million project to connect Westcliff to Delaware and then Delaware all the way out to um, Long Marine Lab Schaefer Road with a multi-use path. And then we have uh, ongoing sewer and storm drain maintenance projects that we spend roughly about a million dollars on. The new projects. So uh, this year, uh, staff is proposing to bring back the traffic calming program um, as a pilot program this year. Uh, traffic calming has always uh, traditionally been a, quite a challenge for staff with regards to funding and resources. Uh, and so it's something we haven't had in the city for almost 20 years now. So we've continued to knock out projects, make improvements on our roadways that include traffic calming, but not specifically its own dedicated program. So this year we're looking at trying to uh, dedicate some other funds, about 75K, to see if we can get some streets, uh, some traffic calming uh, treatments on some of the, some local roads. Uh, next project that's being proposed, it's a new project, um, it's, which is also on your an item and consent later for Measure D is the Broadway Complete Streets project. Um, this was brought to us by a lot of the community members. Uh, we went through the Transportation Public Works Commission. And so we had that project added to the Measure D five-year plan. But um, in talking in, uh, with the community and the commission, we had that out in fiscal 28, but we were able to re readjust some of the projects and move that project into fiscal 26 is when we proposed starting that design. And then the last two you'll see there is a parking office remodel and a food waste pre-processing projects. We don't really know the price tag quite yet. We're starting to do the initial analysis on both of those. Um, the parking office comes out of the parking CIP fund, so that's the downtown parking enterprise fund, and food waste processing would come out of the refuse fund. Okay, and then I uh, just wanted to highlight a few under or unfunded projects that we do have on our radar that we are still continuing to work on. These are critical infrastructure projects that, while we are fighting for construction and even design dollars, we know we need to move some of these forward. And I, I kind of mentioned a couple of them earlier with the electrical upgrade and the Headworks project. But of course, as you can see up there, there's also included the Westcliff Stabilization and Culvert project. Uh, we'll be embarking upon those uh, later this year as well. 
Um, and then a <clears throat> couple of things that we tied into there is the levy maintenance. Uh, but, uh, Mayor, council members, you may recall in the, in the, when we presented the budget operating budget to you last time, we brought up the levy maintenance as a, as a focus and a need uh, towards funding. Um, and then you'll see a storm drain uh, paving project on there on Trevithin. We completed the first phase this last year. Huge success uh, for that neighborhood. And, and, that, and so we're hoping to look for funds to try to complete that uh, phase uh, this upcoming, upcoming year. And then there's the EV charging stations and wharf uh, roundabout bike lane that are also being um, unfunded, but that we hope to work on very soon. And with that, I'll pass it on to Parks and Rec. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Elliott. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Appreciate the opportunity to share the Parks and Recreation Department Capital Improvement Program uh, request for fiscal year 24. Start off with a uh, picture of our golf course there. Uh, sorry, you can move on, thank you. All right, just as far as a CIP snapshot of our active projects, wanted to give some context to the City Council and to the community in terms of what is uh, currently underway. Uh, we currently have about uh, $9.4 million worth of CIP projects that are uh, in process. Uh, you can see how those are divided up uh, on the screen and these two pie charts by both fund source and then by area or amenity within the city park system. Uh, so a couple things I just wanted to flag here. Other relevant details, I think a big chunk, almost $3 million of that $9.4 million um, uh, in uh, current in-process projects are related to the site logic uh, project. So this is in partnership with Public Works, but oriented toward uh, new ball field lighting at Harvey West Park, uh, new uh, solar panels, uh, new roof at the Civic Auditorium, and new solar panels at the Civic Auditorium as well. So a big chunk of that uh, is geared toward really energy efficiency uh, overall. Uh, on the area and amenity, uh, a large proportion of the current investment is going toward our community and regional parks. Um, this is to some degree by design uh, as these community and regional parks uh, host the majority or a large proportion of our community members and visitors to Santa Cruz. Uh, so these are places like Harvey West Park where a lot of this investment is really uh, going. Another chunk of that is going to, toward the um, Civic Auditorium as we mentioned through Site Logic and to the golf course, uh, some of the facilities at the golf course that have uh, really begun to fail in the past couple of years. So some really important investment there. Um, as part of that. On that uh, area and amenity graph, I just wanted to highlight that our open spaces and greenways uh, continue, uh, continue to be a sort of perennially uh, underfunded um, area within the city park system. So we really have very little CIP investment going into our open spaces and greenways uh, through, uh, through our CIP program. So that's something for us to really strategize on and think about uh, moving into future years. Next slide. So as far as our fiscal year 24 uh, funding requests, um, a lot of these here on the screen, really the, the full slate of these on the screen um, are requests for appropriations of our parks facilities tax. So this along with our Quimby fees are part of the, the park impact fees uh, that we receive through residential development. Uh, so the projects here are a breakdown um, uh, as the part of the request for those parks facilities tax fees. So a number uh, related to Harvey West Park uh, toward uh, water conservation and irrigation system improvements um, and to a number of our neighborhood parks as well, uh, including Riverside Gardens uh, and Sergeant Derby. So happy to go into detail on those um, uh, and answer any questions the council may have. So next slide, please. And in this slide here, um, uh, rounds out the request for fiscal year 24, uh, our parks facilities security improvements uh, Harvey West Park redesign, and that would include the Harvey West Pool as well. Uh, and then some critical infrastructure work at De La Viega Park uh, related to stormwater um, uh, issues and, and management there at De La. And so those items uh, we have uh, as TBD um, on the slide or on the screen here, and really that references a variety of funding sources for those projects. So it's a combination of park facilities tax, uh, and general fund CIP or even general fund operating dollars that we might uh, uh, apply towards some of those projects. The Harvey West Park redesign being one 
uh, where 250,000 uh, of that 250,000 is actually already appropriated uh, and is reflected in our ongoing or, or in process CIP project. So 50 of that 250 is, is already appropriated. Uh, the last item up here is the civic access and safety improvement item. This is an item that the city council approved uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or, or so ago, um, through CDBG. Uh, and this is an investment uh, for ADA and safety improvements, hand railing and so forth in the civic auditorium. Um, so related to access, uh, ADA compliance, but also there's a degree of both public and staff safety with that, with hand railing in the civic auditorium. Um, so that one's been approved, but we've put that in the context of the overall uh, CIP slate uh, for 24. And just wanted to also highlight on this slide as far as staff safety, um, this has been a, a big topic, staff safety and security. The item at the top of the, the chart here, the parks facilities security improvements is a really critical one to uh, just help reinforce and secure some of our parks facilities um, at Harvey West and elsewhere. So that's really geared uh, toward that. And beyond CIP, there's a, a lot that we've included in our operating budget that we shared a couple weeks ago, uh, geared toward um, uh, security, uh, allied universal, different security companies to assist with uh, parks and facilities security. So that's separate from CIP, but I think a relevant piece to the overall security and safety of our parks. And last thing I would just say is um, in terms of annual investment, really the target that we look at in terms of uh, uh, the park system that we have, um, the assets that the city uh, maintains and owns, really that investment on an annual basis, that target should be in the range of four to six million dollars. So over the past year or so, I think we've done, a, the city's done a great job, that 9.4 million uh, active uh, in projects, but uh, kind of a target collectively for the city to look at moving the future years is that four to six million dollars in CIP investment year over year to really stay on top of the, the maintenance needs throughout uh, Parks and Rec. And very last thing I would say is related to, um, and actually back to those pie charts, um, there's a section in there related to grants and donations, but this is an area where we uh, engage with our community partners uh, quite a lot. And so recently we've heard from community members fundraising for Harvey West Pool. And so they're aiming to raise 20 to $30 million for the pool, which would be a huge CIP number. That's not reflected here. That money hasn't been raised yet. But as we come back to the city council in future years, um, working with our partners, the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County, Friends of Parks and Recreation and others, we hope to bring some of these opportunities through donors uh, and grants to invest uh, in some of these facilities and parks as well. So more to come on that. That's it. I'll hand it off to, I believe, the fire, uh, Economic Development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Procedurally, what we'll do is we'll hear each of these presentations, then we'll go back when Ms. Cabell comes back up and we will entertain council questions or comments uh, department by department. Ms. Lipscomb, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. I'm happy to present our fiscal year 24 economic development and housing CIP. Um, I'll. Uh, just preface by saying we only have two new projects um, in our CIP this year, uh, the Downtown Alley Improvements and Tannery Dance and Performance Building. But um, before we get into them, I will say um, that uh, we do have other ongoing projects funded in previous years that we're still working on. The nature of so many of our projects, you know, continue from year to year. So uh, including uh, our three affordable housing mixed-use projects in the downtown all have funding in the CIP. Um, this is largely, I'd say, our 2011 bonds proceeds, sort of really that continuation of the last of that redevelopment funding. We also have some major uh, federal grants. There are about 12 different non-general fund funding sources in our CIP when you look through those for the majority of those projects. So happy to answer any questions about those as well. Um, so the first project, um, this is leverage funding, um, matching funding that's required um, as part of our federal grant that we received um, for from the Economic Development Administration to build the Tannery Dance um, Center. And so this is a preliminary design, exterior design of it, and we're doing some environmental testing, geotesting that's required and not eligible from the grant funds. So this is out of our ED Trust Fund. 
And the second one, um, ongoing downtown alley improvements. We're really excited to have this investment. This is um, one of the ones that when the redevelopment terminated in 20, you know, 2011, 2012, we actually went to council um, for approved projects and down alley improvements, sort of a long-term focus was one of those. So we're really excited to be able to move forward in concert with Parks and Rec this year and really do some, some you know, much needed beautification and hopefully some placemaking as well in the alleys. And so this is funded by former RDA bonds. And I'll turn it over to the fire department. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. So I'll, I'll be a brief. Um, unlike last year, we were rel relatively aggressive in our uh, request for CIP. This year, much more measured, um, but still critically important. And those are based on uh, just facility needs and really um, the upgrade and updating of those facilities for two important reasons. One, health and wellness of the workforce. And secondary is just to make sure we're keeping pace with some electrical demands from some of our equipment at one of the stations. So specifically, um, fire station number three, uh, we're looking uh, again for about $200,000. You know, we're still in the early phases. Those were initial quotes. Um, for the equipment at that fire station to replace an existing generator. And again, based on some of the equipment we have out there, air compressors and so forth, um, we have found that we are inadequate in providing enough um, energy or electricity for that purpose, but also making sure that if we have a power outage, we can still operate um, normally. Um, so again, we're looking to, um, we're on the initial phases of the purchasing and um, request for um, for a bid from contractors for that work and looking to start in early 2024. Fire station number two, um, again, uh, an older station that's been around um, not quite as long as station one down here, but we're looking to expand um, out the rear of that station to the tune of about uh, $750,000. Um, like it says here, adding about 1,800 square feet of the, uh, to the existing fire station. And that's really, there's some storage components to it, but the biggest and most important factor in this request is to provide an area for the fire crews to work out whether or not they're currently inside of the apparatus bay. And as you can imagine with diesel powered uh, engines, that becomes uh, complicated and obviously increases the risk for cancer. And so it's something that we've been focused on and we're looking to um, start that work as well um, early in uh, 2024 for this project. And you may recall, recall these were um, proposed last year, but in an effort to keep pace with our apparatus replacement um, needs, our fleet had some challenges with um, procuring parts and services to maintain our aging fleet. So we had to do a, a mid-year sort of adjustment and purchase a fire engine with the funds that were previously approved for these two projects. So really what we did was flip-flop from 23 to 24 for these. So nothing really new, just the timing of them were changed. And happy to answer any questions when the time's appropriate on these. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. So that concludes the presentation for CIP, and staff is here to answer any questions you may have on any projects or anything else. Thank you so much. Let me see if there are questions and comments by council members. Ms. Prudner? Yeah. Um, okay, thank you so much for all of the presentations. I had a um, question for Public Works, and I wonder if Nathan Nguyen could come. Um, so if you could, um, let's see. I don't remember the slide. In the future, it would be helpful to have slide numbers, and then I could say slide number five. Um, but um, I'll see if I can, from my notes, but there was something about um, under design. And um, um, if you can just summarize again, um, these are what's in process versus the next slide, there's some of the repeat items. So can you just talk about that again? There's additional funding needed. So only part of it is currently funded under design, and then the rest that's needed 
So some of those items still have unfunded dollar amounts. Is correct, okay. yeah, that's correct, Councilmember Bruner. So there are projects that um, are in their design currently, um, and those are some of the ones that we focused on in that slide that we wanted to definitely daylight with uh, council members, mayor, and the public. At the same time, though, some of those projects still need funding to move forward into construction. So we still need funding to implement these uh, critical projects. And so as we kind of identified between the two, uh, it's a good catch that there are uh, projects that lie in both of both uh, in design and still underfunded. Okay, thank you. Further questions? One, um, Parks and Rec, Tony Elliott. I wonder if what we might do to expedite this question oh. is if the department heads could come sit in the front row, then we're going to save a little time here. Thank you. Council member, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, can you talk about under, um, it was under fund, so there was the graph, yes, fund source and um, area amenity. Under fund source, uh, under site logic IQ, can you talk a little more about what that includes? Because I know you you had mentioned some of it with public works, and is that what is that represented in by area and amenity? Yeah, it's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, as far as parks and recreation uh, and that component of the site logic work, that is geared toward the new ball field lights at Harvey West Park. Uh, solar uh, installation um, uh, at the park, a new roof on the Civic Auditorium, and solar on the Civic Auditorium roof as well. And I believe there are more components of that site logic project uh, under the Public Works portfolio, and I'd welcome uh, Director Wen to come up and, and speak to that as well. That, that answers my okay. question. Yeah, I sure. just I wanted to be clear that I was understanding that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I will pass it for now. Thank you. Okay, but you want to return to you and potentially. Potentially. But Other questions, comments? Ms. Brown's recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to our presenters. It's good to see um, some really great work happening, and um, I know we have. Uh, challenges with our CIP every year, and it doesn't. It kind of seems to be a, a, a growing need, um, but to see these really critical projects getting accomplished and to see the money that's coming in from competitive funding and other sources, you're all doing an amazing job <laughs> leveraging uh, and and really, um, you know, identifying ways to, to get our priorities uh, met. And um, I'm I've been thinking since 2018 when I was at that fire station, just picturing you all exercising like almost underneath your fire engines and I'm and the exhaust and, and the the health risks there. And so I've it's been on my mind all this time and I'm so glad to um, know it's fine, it's happening. Um, uh, so I'll just leave the comments there. I have a couple of questions for I think parks primarily. Um, thank you for your presentation. It's great to see the um, things that are kind of in, in the, it wasn't organized quite in this way, but the design uh, phase uh, in particular related to um, Harvey West, uh, the pool and the, um, the park. And so I just wanted to ask if I'm understanding this, the, um, the 250,000 for the Harvey West redesign, is that, the intention there uh, to really be looking broadly at that facility overall, as we as we kind of talked about off not in the meeting, that's what that chunk of money is for. So expanding on the contribution that was made to look at the pool specifically and to really focus on the whole site. Okay. Um, yeah, that's exactly you. right. Yep. Got it. Uh, and then the other question was uh, on park pathways. There's a small amount of money in there. Glad to see it. Is, do you, is that uh, programmed for particular locations or is that a fund that you are looking at just to address issues as they arise? Yeah, I'd like to welcome our park superintendent, Travis Beck, to speak to some of those details on that on that piece. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and Council Member Brown. Yeah, the $40,000 pathway improvement project is to address 
uh, a known set of tripping hazards and places where we have concrete displacement throughout the park system. So that has a specific scope of work already identified for it. Thank you. Really, thank you for, for those improvements. Uh, I think that's all for me. Council Member Watkins. Yes, I'll just echo my colleagues' comments in appreciation for all your work. And I know there's always competing priorities, particularly when it comes to our capital improvement program. Um, I, I guess my, I, I guess I have a comment. I think it's probably really clear with the public works, though, in terms of the Murray Street Bridge and the impacts that's going to have. I'm assuming that's all factored in in terms of timing. And I know we've heard concerns from the county in regards to when that is going to be underway. I don't know if there likely there's no perfect time, right? But um, do you have any insights into timing when that might be? Uh, the, the team is still working on trying to get the permits in place, but we are actively, and we do plan on taking it out to bid uh, later this summer. That's right, that's right. And so that's, that is our plan and intent. Um, if things change, we'll definitely come back to a council mayor to give an update on that. Um, as far as the actual construction timing, though, when it actually starts, that's just procuring the contractor. It'll be definitely, once we have a contractor on board, we'll have more details on when the actual physical construction impacts to the roadway the transportation system itself uh, would be. And then we'd also, again, work with our uh, partnering agencies to notify and collaboratively kind of reduce those impacts uh, because they are going to be sustained for, for you know, likely two years. Okay, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, just as long as we're transparent with our community around what's expected there. Um, I guess my other question was if the alleyways, and I know, uh, Bonnie, you mentioned that that's part of our CIP uh, thoughts and, and the wayfinding, et cetera. But I'm wondering, I know we've talked about parklets and other opportunities in some of these smaller spaces for recreation, so I'm not sure if it's an overlap with Parks and Rec, but what is your thoughts on that, or is that part of the CIP planning also, potentially? Yeah, I mean, we have a total of what we added on, proposed to add on this year, and previously we have about 500,000 for the alleyways, and we have three alleyways downtown that we're really focused on. So Fraser Lewis Lane, Pearl Alley, and um, the the, the one right behind, um, trying to think now, no. Plaza Lane. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, so we are looking specifically, we actually just did a site walk yesterday and looking at um, lighting improvements um, and hopefully working with Parks and Rec on some overall, you know, general landscaping um, as well. Uh, but we're also hoping for some activation. We were looking at opportunities, and um, definitely in Plaza Lane, there's an opportunity for some potential outdoor dining in, like, one area that we were looking specifically. If we could activate, we're looking at ways to activate. You know, some of those spaces are quite large, particularly in Plaza Lane, as you look at that. Obviously, in Fraser Lewis Lane behind uh, Del Williams, you know, there's some space there. And during the pandemic, we had really successful outdoor dining there, you know. So we know that it works. And so we're looking at what, what is some permanent infrastructure support that we can put in to really help this uh, successfully move forward. I'm definitely supportive of that. I think people choose if they could to go outside and sit outside, particularly for dining purposes, but also with all of the development happening on Front Street in terms of a space for kids to play, locked, you know, potentially, but with um, play structure that parents could have eyes on them. I think that's a really, I, I've always thought that's an opportunity. And so however that's factored into your, your, um, your planning and your consideration, I'd like to make a plug for that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Vice Mayor is recognized. Thank you. Um, I think my first questions are for Nathan. Um, okay, so I have I saw Westcliff on the unfunded, but there are some parts that are funded, right? That's correct. We, we put it we under, just aren't mentioned under it was, slash unfunded. Yeah, okay. um, we, we do expect to receive uh, FHWA grants to make repairs on Westcliff. But at the same time, we also are preparing for a local match if we're not able to meet the uh, September 23rd deadline date for 100% reimbursement. And so we just wanted to identify that as a as a project where we were saying it's underfunded at the moment. Yeah. Got it. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to clarify. And then my other question for you is in regards to food waste. And I know residential and maybe some businesses have larger containers and residential has the little brown ones. Are those something that the city has to purchase or are those something individual businesses have to purchase I know like the schools have been talking about rolling this out. Like, is that something? I believe the food waste uh, program is something that we're mandated and that we are as residents, we are including that into our um, refuse rates increase as far as 
providing those bins for all of our uh, both commercial and residential uh, users out there. And so if it's something beyond the uh, city service, if we're talking about food waste, uh, purchasing a separate bin, then that would be outside the scope of the services that we were providing. But, so, but just, the, the, I'm assuming that the, those bins that we got, they're not free, you had to buy them. And so there, is there bigger ones that are out at restaurants at this point or um, businesses or that's why I don't, I don't know. Someone's coming. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask our operations manager, uh, Just, Lupe, to come in and answer that question. Well, I'm asking my operations manager. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. Um, we purchased them already. We have um, containers for residential, commercial, and um, schools as soon as they're ready to participate. Got it. Okay. Okay. So you've already, I just didn't know if that was another thing that we still have to purchase. They're pretty expensive. Yes. Thank you. Um, I did have one question for Tony Elliott. Um, and I didn't know if this is possible. Um, when you're looking at Harvey West, is it possible to charge for parking? Could that money go back to parks? I think it's a, I think it's a great question. Um, I think in theory we could. Um, I believe, and I don't know that we've got our parks planner here. Um, I want to say that we've looked at this in the past. It wasn't necessarily received well. Uh, but I, I, I can't I know imagine, to, but I still thought about it. <laughs> I know enough to be dangerous on that, but I think it, it's worth looking into and reconsidering um, yeah, how we can generate revenue, revenue there to invest in the park. So I think it's a, it's a good idea. Okay. That, was, that was my only question. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Mr. Newsom is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. And I um, you know, just want to uh, echo the comments made by Council Member uh, Watkins about uh, it's really exciting to see uh, uh, possible funds uh, dedicated for downtown alley improvements. I think that'll be great for our downtown businesses and for our community and provide for great spaces for people to eat and, and enjoy um, our downtown spaces. Uh, so uh, I was excited to see that. Ms. Brenner? All good? Okay. All in? Very good. Thank you all so very much for being here. Thank you for your very informative presentations and your good work year in and year out. We will see you later in the day when we get around to budget in a moment. Thank you all very much for that. We're on item six. This is a uh, presentation from the City Council's Ad Hoc Budget and Revenue Committee. Uh, some time ago, not very long ago, uh, the council gave very specific direction to your ad hoc budget and revenue committee regarding assisting the community in taking a look at potential affordable housing revenue stream uh, measures. Uh, your, the council's committee consists of Council members Newsom, Brown, and myself, and uh, we would uh, like to report back to you. You folks gave us a very specific task, and that was within a specific period of time, uh, have used the resources available, uh, made available by the council to the subcommittee. Uh, for conducting a public research uh, poll regarding voter attitudes concerning a draft housing revenue measure. Uh, tested out a number of questions around that about what were high priority uh, issues for the community with regard to affordable housing and homeless uh, capital outlay side of those issues. and. Uh, uh, the results uh, came back, and, and we'll discuss them in a little more detail as we move along. That was made available to all of the members of the public, not only those who showed up, but posted on, on our website. Uh, as we began this effort, the uh, Santa Cruz County Civil Grand Jury also issued a series of reports, one of which uh, is entitled Housing Our Workers, Essential Workers Need Affordable Housing, which certainly uh, works hand in glove with the assessment that this body has made over time that uh, certainly essential workers
do in fact need affordable housing and part of the objective uh, of uh, giving the ad hoc budget and revenue committee portfolio to work on this issue was to uh, was exactly for this purpose identified by by the civil grand jury the uh, other task that was given to us was to conduct a series of community meetings in which the community would have the opportunity to use the research that the city paid for uh, as a way to think about how to color inside the lines, if you will, that the poll provides information about the public attitude and priorities and the work of the public in these three meetings is to see how they might be able to, uh, how the city can assist the public if uh, the public would wish to uh, take the initiative and and move along with regard to a, uh, a possible funding measure. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, turn now to Council Member Brown for a, a quick uh, report on our first meeting that took place. Council Member. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> I want to thank my uh, colleagues on the Budget and Revenue Committee uh, for participating in this, and really a big thank you to staff as well for all of the work that you put in. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and uh, so, so it was, uh, I'll say, the first meeting was um, an introduction, an overview of the process. Uh, we brought uh, quite a, you know, a, energetic group of people together show, uh, showed up for that meeting. I see some head shake nodding uh, people who were there. Um, we, um, you know, it was an opportunity to kind of go through some of that overview of the, the need for affordable housing. Also to, um, there's a slot, the next slide, I just wanna um, sh just mention um, to, to preview this amazing tool that the city is is now Making available, which um, uh, you can, where you can track housing, uh, affordable housing projects, uh, and and see, get more information about them. So this is an incredible tool. I just want to thank you for um, making it available. It was a great place to kind of bring this out, and and I hope that folks will really use it. Um, so what we did at that meeting was, um, you know, really go over the um, kind of a discussion about. Um, you know, what kind of measure uh, would we were going to try to, you know, pe people were interested in, I guess, the, com the community, um, proposed uses of the funding. So one of the questions was um, in breakout groups, everybody went in great breakout groups, did really great group work. It was great to see people from kind of different, uh, I'm just going to add a little editorial here, um, uh, different, uh, you know, uh, interest groups within the county, different, uh, or within the city, different um, kind of perspectives coming together to have those conversations um, and a really welcome uh, kind of opportunity there. And, uh, and then we kind of uh, just talked about forecasting for the next meeting that we would have polling information available and begin to refine some of that conversation. Uh, I will say that the list that pe folks came up with uh, in spite of some uh, directed questions uh, was robust <laughs> and um, you know so there's a there's a lot that kind of got covered which we won't go into the weeds here um, but it, there it was clear there was a lot of interest in moving forward with something and a lot of really great ideas um, coming to the table uh, some of it was messy but also very interesting um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it there and pass it off to council member Newsom uh, to talk about the, the next two meetings uh, oh, thank you, uh, Mary Keeley and Councilmember uh, Brown, and, and thank you uh, uh, for your work uh, I'm on the committee and in these meetings. Uh, and also, I want to thank the staff for all their uh, work uh, that they did putting these meetings on. They did um, a really excellent job. Um, the second meeting uh, focused on the details of a potential measure. Uh, and this meeting began with the presentation of the results from a public opinion poll uh, conducted on the public's thoughts on a, a potential measure uh, and the top line. Uh, polling results show that around 63 to 65 percent of community support for a measure uh, and support for a measure that includes uh, funding for affordable workforce housing and funding for uh, infrastructure and housing that addresses homelessness. Uh, 
Participants uh, then broke into groups, uh, debated on what the top three priorities uh, for a proposed measure should be or what they thought the top three priorities should be, um, and then reported back to the committee their thoughts. Um, and then the third and final meeting uh, focused on uh, a draft measure. Uh, this meeting began with the presentation of a potential of a draft measure based on feedback from the first two community meetings and polling research results and legal review. Uh, and the meeting uh, also included group work, dis uh, group work uh, with those in the groups discussing and then recording specific feedback from community members on changes to draft measures, including eligible uses, accountability, uh, specifying affordability levels, clarifying support for types of uh, for types of measures, and clarifying preferred amounts uh, for levying a tax in the measure. Thank you. The uh, I believe that it's fair to characterize the when the last meeting, the third and last meeting was uh, was conducted at the end of it or during the meeting actually. Uh, we, we took a quick people poll, the folks who were there, asking if they felt that they were uh, ready to coalesce behind something or if they feel that more, uh, more consultation with each other, more meetings might make sense. And so uh, the vast majority of folks who were at meeting number three said they would like to have a couple of more community meetings insofar as they felt that progress was being made, communication lines were opening up, uh, but that three meetings was not going to be sufficient time for them to, to be able to get to goal. Uh, following that meeting, it was the judgment of the, of the city attorney that the city has gone now as far as we can go uh, and as far as we can go was incorporated in your original direction to us. So we have now completed that. The number of folks uh, at those meetings and subsequently have indicated uh, that they are desirous of taking this work product from here and continuing to refine it and see if uh, folks who are in fact interested in this can uh, uh, coalesce behind something over the course of the next little while. So in my judgment, the city has provided very sufficient resources to help focus the conversation, to assess whether or not the need is there, to engage the community in a thoughtful conversation about uh, potential measures. And as I say, you will probably hear from folks today who are either call in or whatever it may be, who are indicating they would like to take this uh, from here and continue to move forward. So this is the completion of the city's formal activity in this. We, council members may choose individually to participate in other activities uh, uh, that are not uh, formally part of this to continue with the community's interest in, in moving something forward. We would be glad to answer questions if you have them. Okay, all right, and certainly, certainly. On my talking points, I was so excited uh, um, that I, I did want to say that the um, out of these meetings, the, the we have a mailing list of 75 people who um, showed up and were interested, and so you know I think that 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 was um, that was really great to see, and so the idea that there are folks from among this 75 and, and hopefully more joining, uh, we'll, we'll try to move something forward is, is worth noting as well. And um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, my, uh, let me ask if uh, there's anyone with us today who might wish to comment on this item. This would be the opportunity to do so. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bill from the farm. Um, I would like to sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, thank Mayor Keeley oh, well, thank for his far-sighted and healing effort to create a community process. Am I doing this right? No. Um, to discuss our extremely challenging housing crisis in Santa Cruz. I can't tell you how gratifying it was for me two weeks ago to find myself in that room at the police station with people from all across the political spectrum 
all eager to talk to each other about crafting a citizen's initiative. I think those not there uh, would have been really surprised to see who was sitting at the tables talking to each other, people who don't usually talk to each other. And I hope, I think they would be pleased to see the mix of people and the animated and friendly conversations that were happening. Um, I recall that Ryan Coonerty wrote an op-ed piece criticizing recent initiatives in Santa Cruz for not soliciting community input in the development of our initiatives. And it seemed to me that our mayor, Mayor Keeley, was trying to correct that problem by soliciting broad community input into the affordable housing initiative. Um, the spirit and hopefulness in the room was so palpable that Mayor Keeley, as he said, offered to extend the meeting later that night and into two more meetings. I left feeling really good about our city. Yesterday I found out that that support is not going to be ongoing as we had expected. I was all ready for the fourth meeting tomorrow night. Um, it seems now that the city cannot or will not, I'm not sure, support Mayor Keeley's effort to provide in, in ongoing support to this collaborative process. I'm disappointed, but I fear that something, I'm, I'm afraid that something positive is being aborted prematurely. My only hope now is what Mayor Keeley and others have suggested, is that leaders and supporters among all the groups represented at those first three meetings, including both sides in the recent measure O and empty tax battles will step forward, meet together, and at least try to continue the process sparked by Mayor Keeley. I'm afraid that without this kind of broad spectrum participation, the kind of carefully crafted and bold initiative that might have won support from a majority of our community just won't happen. We need this to happen. We need this process to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who is going to be commenting on this? So Ms. Carrillo, good, good afternoon. We'll, we'll start with someone online after Ms. Carrillo. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Ah. Um, I also was inspired and grateful to see the city and the community coming together and having this discussion um, about raising money to directly address our housing crisis, which we all know is a crisis. <clears throat> and I think everybody in our community can agree that we need housing for low through very through moderate, very low through moderate income earners in order for our city to be diverse and inclusive. I went to the community meeting two weeks ago to understand the discussion and the strategies to build a fund that would, were, would be directed to building housing for those that are priced out of one of the least affordable cities in the country, as you know, if not maybe the world, I can't remember. <clears throat> I learned that the aim was to raise money through a nominal and probable, probably agreeable $95 par parcel tax. But a Zoom participant's query about real estate transfer taxes sparked my interest. Sandy explained that the staff had run numbers on how much this one-time tax could bring, in, could bring in based on a measure that San Jose voters adopted in 2020. San Jose has a graduated tax in place on only sales that exceed $2 million. She said that based on that model, Santa Cruz would take in about $10 million a year, which didn't mean anything to me because I didn't know what to expect at all. And then we were given a chart that showed how much income would come in from the property tax that we were um, hoping to put into place. And it said a million and a half. And as you who were there know, I was shocked to to see the difference and wondered why we weren't aiming for the $10 million because we need it and that would leverage a lot more money. Um, so I went home and I started doing research, which I love to do, and I discovered that the current trend in city fundraising is actually implementing real estate transfer taxes in, I don't know if I said California, but in California. And in the past few years, 20, 21 cities have actually adopted various forms of it, um, kind of geared for their own situation. Um, 
But um, although everybody I spoke to wanted to raise the larger amount of money, basically the attitude was that it can't happen here, can't happen in Santa Cruz. That the Santa Cruz Board of Realtors and the group, the powerful group Santa Cruz together would fight tooth and nail. Did we have a time timing? Ahead, take, oh, I didn't know it. I'm almost done and I slowed down in speaking because I didn't know we had a time. Um, so what I've envisioned, a little bit along Barbara's lines, but more specific, as we seek ways to move forward to help our friends, neighbors, essential workers, and unhoused, it's my deepest hope that representatives of these groups will join with the other groups, to re with all the groups, to redirect a tiny portion of our real estate boom by devising a modification of what other cities are doing so that our fund for low-income housing can see greater, far greater returns than it would through a parcel tax. And that could be, you know, less than 10, you know, could be 5 million, it could, but it would be a boon. Um, can we work together to arrive at a compromise to support those who work to support our city? Let's make history and show that we can. And I just wanted people to mull that over in our community. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Carrillo. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bush, we'll take the first person online now. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah, this is Garrett. Hey, uh, the creating the bond meeting process so far was mostly a very strange, actually backwards workshop version of what's known as the Delphi technique. In the reverse of that method, the wrong people run the meeting who talk selectively, the wrong people ask only their questions, and the public gets little time to speak or carefully consider what is supposed to be a public initiative was very rushed, including little time to consider a nine-page, very vague, lawyered up, very fine print initiative that the government gave us. After quiet consideration at home, my opinion of the city's draft is that it is a well-concealed blank check and no more. It's a forever, permanently, yearly increasing parcel tax capable of generating huge unknown debt obligations for very vaguely described uses, allowing even undefined ones. Also shocking is it allows the council to change mostly all of it at will later. There was no actual voting of the people taken. The operative phrases of the fund uses are in accordance with including but not limited to, which means maybe this or maybe that or maybe something else undefined, whatever the city wants, and ends on the date of a repealing initiative, meaning it normally would tax in increasing amounts forever and can encumber unrevocable large debts at unknown interest rates. All of the uses need better definition by the people as this is a special purpose public initiative act and not just a huge list of vague sales job Trojan horse shiny objects which may or may not get funded. It also allows the funds to sponsor further initiatives and not to produce any results just ever higher taxes. That 98% of the people will pay to no self benefit and regressively the poor will also pay in higher rents due to higher parcel taxes. It may very well hurt vastly more people than help those that it is supposed to, and the workforce housing is a sham cover concept because there's no way to prevent, for instance, foreign or out-of-state or out-of-county students or the better off from being subsidized. The what, where, when, and how much for every use is way too vague. I'm personally not interested in subsidizing indoctrinated transient students getting degrees in Marxist sociology with a minor in man-hate feminism going back to their rich daddy suburbs elsewhere to foment insurrection. Maybe the people need their own lawyer in this one. As to the homeless part, you haven't anywhere near finished job number one of first finding a fiscally efficient, economically sustainable basis of preventing huge unsanctioned encampments, which is uh, really the only thing everybody agrees on, as your very expensive responses so far are running out of money. And I understand it's a problem and we need to work on that. Uh, focusing on that modest objective that everybody agrees on before asking for an extra endless supply of welfare money to do the impossible for a city and homelessness in our time. <laughs> the goal. If the Fed, state, and county aren't taking this on, how can we trust that you will succeed when they have not? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillip, and thank you for attending the meetings. Anyone else with us today wish to come in? Anyone else online? We'll go to the next person online. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. This is Jim Weller. Am I being heard? Good afternoon. Uh, Jim Weller here. Am I being heard? Yes, you are, Jim. Okay, good. I'm remote and I couldn't tell. I, too, uh, would like to very much thank and appreciate the, um, the initiative uh, of the mayor and the city council members budget committee um, to facilitate the process that has begun. Uh, I'm uh, very favorable toward uh, continuing the process. Obviously, we all agree that we need uh, uh, much more uh, funding to support affordable housing. And um, although the process to date has been uh, uh, messy, one might say, and uh, uh, confusing to some, uh, I, for one, am uh, ready to step up and take part in, uh, in a community-based group that uh, carries the process forward. And uh, I still think that it's uh, very much worth the effort. Uh, I agree with Ms. Carrillo that um, a documentary transfer tax increase uh, could be uh, an extremely useful uh, new source of revenue. And clearly, I've done the analysis myself, clearly it would produce something on the order of $10 million a year uh, if we charged 1% of the uh, value of each transaction. Uh, however, I'm very concerned about the political prospect of uh, trying to move forward with that proposal, with a documentary transfer tax proposal, because indeed, as, as Ms. Carrillo said, it would attract uh, fierce opposition from the real estate sector, which would no doubt be extremely well-funded. Um, and I'm afraid that if we were to uh, switch to a proposal along those lines, it would derail the progress we've already made um, toward a successful parcel tax. So um, I'd like the documented transfer tax proposal. I'd like to go forward with it in a measured and, and uh, deliberate way uh, but not now. I want to go forward with the, uh, the developing parcel tax proposal and get it done uh, in the way that uh, it has begun. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weller. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Yes. Okay. Tell me when you're ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And this is Jane Barr with Eden Housing. Thank you for uh, dealing with this issue today. I was pleased to attend two of the three meetings. Um, I um, am very proud of the city of Santa Cruz for the work they're doing in housing currently and uh, look at this as another step forward um, to uh, serve their uh, uh, population. Um, there's possibly going to be a bond at the state level for uh, funding for affordable housing. Um, that's great. It may or may not pass, but it will still require local gap financing from cities. And I look at this bond as, as uh, being able to fulfill that and allow the city to move forward with its um, allocation on the uh, regional housing needs assessment as, as uh, outlined in the state and by AMBAG. Um, I think it's critical that uh, this move forward and um, we are totally in support of the city and appreciate the work that the city has been doing and hopefully that the residents of Santa Cruz will pick up from here on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Do we have anyone else, Ms. Bush? We do. <coughs> Tell me when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and council members. Thank you for taking up this important issue. Um, I am very appreciative of the work that you've done up to this point. The public opinion poll showed a real appetite on the part of um, city residents and voters uh, about making something happen. Um, the draft work and the overall heavy lifting that your city staff, including city attorney and um, uh, economic development director was really kind of heroic on short notice. So I'm just appreciative of the work that you've all put into this so far. Um, it's clear that conversations need to continue. 
Um, you know housing is hard, but we appreciate that you have a good faith determination to do the best you can. And I just want you to know that we are here with you as uh, these important conversations continue, and hopefully we can make progress. I will end with this. Um, housing is hard. I don't have to tell you that. Even if a bond passed and raised between 2 and $3 million a year, that will not solve all of the problems. So kind of an all hands on deck, all tools in the toolbox approach is going to be required. But this is one important element that can be achieved. And uh, I look forward to participating in that process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldenkrantz. Thank you for your participation in the meeting so far. Ms. Bush, anyone else? No. We're off? Okay. The, uh, uh, if I could conclude with these comments. Uh, one, I want to take a moment, spend some time on, on what the staff did on this. Uh, within the bounds of what the law allows, the staff was enormously helpful. I want to start with the city manager's office. Thank you for the work you did to uh, find a vendor and structure a public opinion research document that provided very good information for the public, the council, and others to use. Your office was the pointy end of the spear in getting that work done. We very, very much appreciate it. City Attorney, thank you very much for your repeated drafting efforts as this was moving along. Uh, Ms. Lipscomb and your team, thank you for the data and information that helped everyone, uh, irrespective of what your information level was, everyone got educated and smartened up through that uh, three-week process, and you were a key to that. Uh, other members of the city manager's staff, uh, both communications and your deputies uh, were enormously helpful, as was uh, Mr. Butler and other city staff who assisted the public in their work during these meetings. The, uh, there is, I will say, a, uh, a, uh, a strong interest uh, in the community. Uh, I suspect council members uh, Newsom and Brown have received the kind of feedback I've received in the last week or so, which is uh, we community would like to continue these conversations and we'll take the handoff from here, but encouraging us to be involved with them as we, we move along in our individual capacities in life. Uh, so thank you all very, very much for this. I think it's a good start. I see that Mr. Lane and Ms. Johnson have shown up. I'm gonna go a little bit out of order. If you have comments on this item, please feel free. We are just wrapping it up right now. So, uh, yes, there you go. Make a, make a fast run to the dais there. Mr. Former Mayor, sir. Thank you so much for um, giving me a chance. I just rushed down here as soon as I knew it was time, but I didn't get here quick enough. Um, Don Lane. And I'm part of several affordable housing organizations, but I'm not speaking on behalf of any of those. Um, but speaking personally, I've been very involved, as many of you know, in of trying to find affordable housing uh, funding solutions for this community for many years. And I just want to express my appreciation to the council that you are carrying that forward, creating a new opportunity to pursue that. And as a, just as an individual and as a member of some organizations, I will be one of those who will take the handoff uh, uh, with the opportunity you've created and try to move something forward in this community. So it's so important. People who are without affordable housing right now are counting on not just you, but all of us in the community to take some serious steps on this. Um, we're really constantly losing people in this community who cannot afford to live here anymore. We need them all here. Um, so I just appreciate the work you've done to set this up, and I want to keep working with you to make something happen. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Ms. Johnson, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. I'm glad I made it on time. Yeah, right. Um, well, too. thank you for the opportunity to be here. I just wanted to take a few minutes to acknowledge you, Mayor Keeley, the city staff, and everyone who has put their time and effort into what putting this bond together. It speaks volumes, the invitation to the community to be of support, to have a, a voice in putting this bond together. I, I, it speaks volumes of 
how we want to continue to have the community to grow. So I want to commend you and the city staff and the council for, for, for taking that leap, because it's a big leap. And it was a great leap, because I, I, I attended all three of those meetings, and I was very pleased um, with how the community got to come together and to be a voice in to what we put together versus something being told to them. So I commend you for that. And I, too, stand here before you. Affordable housing is so critical in this community. And whatever we can do to continue to move this forward, you have my support. Ms. Johnson, thank you so much. Thank you for your good work overall every day on this topic. Very much appreciate it. You're so very welcome. Thank you. The, uh, uh, thank you for that. Ms. Brown. I, I don't want to prolong this. Um, any longer, but I did want to just, um, I realized that there were some things that I wanted to say about the interactive map. I was so excited. I just said, oh, great. You know, um, look at it. Everyone look at it. See what I see. Um, <laughs> so I just, I did want to say, because it, it's kind of in response to this question about uh, revenue measure that could bring in uh, more than a parcel tax, um, which I also support, and I'm not going to talk about that here. But um, what I did want to say, um, is that if, if you go and look at that map um, or just think about affordable housing that gets built in our community, uh, it, it really illustrates the need for a local revenue source. And we have, and one of the things that really was um, emphasized, and um, I know this, but it, it just hit home really clearly at our third meeting that um, this is really like um, you know, having a small amount of money, even if it's it's not enough to do near what we want to see happen, um, it is the critical uh, money to fill gaps when uh, affordable housing projects are, are have almost all the funding they need, but maybe um, need like a little bit more to get it over the finish line. So um, these, while a small amount of funding, very critical for the city's efforts. And I myself have seen in my time on the council projects that have actually come to fruition because we had a uh, small amount of money in our affordable housing trust fund. So um, I'm all for uh, any and all resources that we can get towards this, this uh, need and um, want to have the conversation with the community as we move forward. Thanks for letting me jump in again. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Uh, uh, please, please. Ms. Brenner. Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation and um, for the information and the detailed updates um, as, you know, to avoid any violation of Brown Act. Um, all of us were not involved in, in those meetings, but um, I did pop in for 15 minutes on one of the meetings and saw a pretty full room, which was encouraging. Um, I, I do uh, want to just quickly ask if the city manager's office and specifically communications, it might be helpful, and maybe it's already being thought of and done, to have some kind of conclusion statement to the process thus far for the public. I think there's still uncertainty and, and um, questions about what the city is doing and not doing, can you or won't you or will you? People are confused, and so I've I've happily met with different people who have asked about the process, who don't quite understand the legal limitations, and I think it's it would be helpful if there was kind of a summary that we could put out for the public to say, hey, this is what we did, this is where we are at, and now the community is taking this further, and I just kind of some wrap-up. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. I'll be glad to work with the city manager in that Thank regard. Thank you. Thank you. For the questions, comments, observations, very last comment is uh, there's been references made to it's messy. I'm happy it's messy. Uh, having had the great honor of serving in the legislature to represent you there, I'll tell you that's 24-7 every day of the week. When you make legislation, write laws, uh, or attempt to, it's designed to be messy. It's not supposed to be neat and orderly. It's supposed to be messy. There's lots of points of view. 
There's a lot of people walking in with all kinds of information, misinformation, not enough information, too much information, all kinds of things, points of view, lived experience, all sorts of things. So you put everybody together. Uh, it shouldn't surprise anybody. It's going to be a little messy, and it might take longer than three public meetings to get to goal. Uh, so we'd be glad to get that piece of information out. Those of us who've been part of this uh, uh, want to continue on. I certainly do. Uh, I appreciate uh, Mayor Lane and, and Andrew Goldencrantz and others who are working, began working the next day uh, among themselves, reaching out to the people who were in these community meetings. and. Uh, uh, they are picking up the ball and going to be moving forward. So uh, uh, here's for striking a blow for messiness. I uh, think it's a good idea to, to be messy because that's how you end up with good product as things get messy to start with and then they get a little more organized as you move through time. But thank you to everyone who's been involved in that. We are now on item seven. This is uh, council meeting calendar. Uh, Ms. Bush, any items here that we sh you should bring to our attention particularly? No, no, no I don't. Okay. All right. We are on the consent agenda. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the consent agenda, how it works, there's a whole group of items, items 8 through 23. We will be taking those up on one motion, which would approve them all. If you have a question or a comment or want the item pulled for more discussion, we can do that. I will start with uh, the council members and see if they have an item upon which they'd like to make comment or have an item pulled. Start working our way through here, working our way through here. Looks like we're good there. Let me give the opportunity to the public. Uh, if there is any item that you wish to comment on, this would be the time to do so, or an item pulled for further consideration. You see, seeing and hearing none, do we have someone online? Let's go to that person. Good afternoon. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett again. Hey, as to item 14, I would re re reiterate that when a judge says you're wrong, it means you are wrong for as long as natural gas ban judgments vacate similar ordinances. That you continue to plot an end around is disturbing, as are statements that the judge's ruling doesn't apply here, which is, I guess, technically true, uh, but it does apply from a potential liability perspective or it would not necessitate this item. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I'll mention it again. Uh, uh, it's not that important, but uh, I noticed in the item 20 summary, you claim to provide four service tags for bulky items which uh, I, I now see are called virtual ex extra curbside service coupons, which are not so virtual going through a phone number or email and re refer to pickups of a bag of trash or up to four bulky items. I'm just saying again, this is still an expensive change you made delivering far less service than what we had before when we could take four small pickup loads at green waste or bulky items and one pickup load of trash to the dump ourselves at no cost to uh, transport savings to the city you know, and also a savings to ourselves. Um, whatever. Um, as to uh, charges for food scrap recycling, I still would like the idea that a citizen could opt out of that for a small discount and give their cans back if they comp compost all their food scraps in the backyard. Um, I would point out this, I guess I'm taking liberties here, but I, I would point out virtually every meeting now has fee increases on it as the city is obsessed with increasing revenue, growing the government in size and expense, bigger government, smaller citizens, instead of also showing us you can also cut costs. Maybe you should change the name of the ad hoc budget and revenue subcommittee to the ad hoc budget revenue and expense reduction subcommittee. Hey, it couldn't hurt. It might give you some ideas what you should be doing. Uh, name one thing about any item today that cuts expense. I would guess that you cannot. And I wonder if the million dollars or so getting the first electric garbage truck going had anything to do with exploding costs and future cost projections. Thanks. Is there anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No? Any further comments on consent? Ms. Brown? I ha actually do have a quick question on Certainly. item 18, if I could. Item 18? We, yeah. Before we, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't 
no, no, do that right. sooner. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to ask uh, Public Works, thank, for, thank you. Uh, I know the neighbors are excited about this um, project happening. Um, and we did hear from some folks who were, you know, saying yes, thank you. Um, we, we're looking forward to seeing this moving forward, but also we're wondering about uh, the potential to meet. I, it sounded like there were, in the past, there have been meetings with neighbors in the Neary area when this occurs. Um, is that gonna happen? Is there a way to communicate with the neighbors and other interested parties before the work is done? Uh, I can reach out to staff to find out what uh, previous communications have happened with the public and see if we could uh, replicate have another, that. yeah, replicate that. That would be going great. Forward. Thank you. Further questions or comments on the consent agenda? A motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted would be in order. So moved. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second by the vice mayor. Debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Can I confirm that it was Councilmember Watkins? <coughs> Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. The motion passes and so ordered. We are on items 24 and 25, which is the consent public hearing items. We will take up uh, items 24 and 25 on the agenda. Uh, are there council members who wish to comment uh, on this item? Council member Bruner, you are recognized. <laughs> I'm uh, wondering if we can separate them out since I've recused myself from item 24. Uh, separate them out in terms of a motion. Any item that can be divided shall be divided if requested is, I believe, the rule on that. So yes, we can. Okay, further questions, comments on the consent agenda public hearing. We're now going to go to the public for any comment on items on item 24. This is the Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessments for fiscal year 2024. Is there anyone online who wishes to make comment? Not for 24, no. Not for item 24. The correct action here would be for a motion to confirm the resolution Move. by Mr. Newsom, seconded by Ms. Brown. Debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Um, she recused herself. Oh, this, she recused herself. Um, Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Passes and so ordered. Item 25, an expansion of technology surcharge. Let me ask if there are questions, comments by Council members, is there anyone on line? Ms. Bush, let's go to that person first. Good afternoon. Okay, this will be my last time today. This is Garrett. Hey, there's four agenda items with the specific intent of jacking the public's wallets on this agenda. One wonders if there'll be five next meeting. Does anyone know what the city record is for the most single agenda items jacking the public's wallet? I understand sometimes in business, there is internal accounting used to allocate actual costs of common core business functions like IT according to separate department actual usages during the year to determine the separate P&Ls for the departments. This is a little different in that you guess actual usage rates of this software for departments that charge fees. Fees somehow you 100% assign as outside the department's function as a general service we pay for with taxes that you instead assign to be paid for by permit. Any permit will do. Some new departments uh, uh, you propose adding these IT surcharges for are a stretch to simple minds like mine that they can actually use land management software. Nobody should actually pay $300,000 for software licenses if the software wasn't worth it. By worth it, I, that normally means that there's such a huge cost savings, which you don't quantify but admit there are considerable cost savings, that should offset a portion of the cost of the software, well, 100% if it was worth it anyway, such as uh, neither needing uh, fewer employees from greater productivity or offering new previously unavailable services that would generate higher revenue from more new user fees. 
Somehow all of this is totally discounted. The entire cost is simply assigned to existing permits as if nothing about permits benefits uh, the public as a whole, such as green building fees. We are asked to take your word for it that all these departments like accounting, fire, parks, public works will actually need and be using land management software. Rental inspection and code compliance caught my eye, and you are correct. Fines there are to enforce compliance, but similar to police infractions, nobody expects income from infractions to pay for police, and uh, suppose nobody's ever fined. General funds pay for the existence because their existence is for everyone's benefit. It is likely you are buying sufficient software licenses for uh, Priority Peak Command, and there could be times when uh, nobody else is using it that other you know, lower priority departments could use it essentially for free. It's a stretch for the public to believe all permits need land management software. Here's a, well, I guess I'll just end it there. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No. Anyone who wishes to comment on this item? Matter of fact, before the council. Motion? Is there a motion? Yep, I'll move the item. Second. Motion is to approve the staff recommendation as presented. There's a motion by uh, Ms. Watkins, a second by Ms. Brown. Debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Torrey Johnson, absent. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Cooley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We're on item 26. This is a tree appeal at 233 Union Street. Uh, we will proceed through this as follows. We will receive a uh, presentation uh, from Ms. Keedy, our urban forester, and then we will provide opportunities for appellants and respondents. We will start with Ms. Keedy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ms. Keedy. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Keedy, urban forester with the city. Um, okay, a bit of background. Well, the recommendation would be is that the city council uphold the Parks and Recreation decision to uphold the tree removal and deny the appeal. Uh, on January 11th of 2023, the applicant, Dorth Raffelli, submitted an application requesting removal of two heritage-sized coast redwoods at 233 Union. On February 13th, Elise Casby and Marvin Lewis filed an appeal of that decision. We had a Parks and Rec Commission meeting on the 8th of May and uh, the commission voted to deny the appeal and support the staff recommendation to remove the two trees. In addition to my opinion, supporting removal of the two trees, the applicant has obtained some additional information in your packet, which is a review from a structural engineer confirming that there is damage to the structural integrity of the building. And then uh, to support my arborist opinion, there are also two additional arborist opinions that have been provided in your packet to state that um, we all, as certified arborists, believe that there are no valid mitigation measures such as root pruning to protect the structure. Uh, since this item was going a bit quicker than we anticipated, I don't know if the applicant is here yet, but I do know that the appellant is here. Uh, but I'll go ahead and do a PowerPoint for you folks. And uh, let me ask you this, do, do we have contact information for, for that person who's not here? I texted them and told them, so it was the realtor is the agent, and then the property owner. Initially, the estimate was at 220 that this would be heard. And so we're going a little bit quicker, and I don't see them in the audience. Mayor, don't look at that clock. It's an hour ahead. <laughs> That's very helpful to me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Boy, is that helpful to know. <laughs> Okay, he says that he, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, just got a text back. He says he's on his way. He'll be here by 2. What? Well, let's, I, I want to get some advice here. I want to make sure we're doing this right. Uh, would it be better to hold on this for a few minutes or, or proceed? I don't want to disadvantage anyone in this process. My recommendation would be to take a 10-minute um, recess and let's and let's do that. We'll just take a few minutes. Okay, we'll come back. they I'm sure would appreciate that. And it's all. It gives me a chance to regroup too because you folks were going wonderful. really much quicker than I anticipated. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. you bet. So we will stand in recess until what alleges to be two o'clock. Alleges. <laughs> Good afternoon. Council is back in session after a recess. Uh, we are on item 26. This is a tree appeal for 233 Union Street. We had just begun the staff presentation and we wanted to, uh, we recessed so that we could have an opportunity or actually uh, all the parties to this issue could have an opportunity to get here into council chambers. So uh, Ms. Keedy, please continue with your presentation. Thank you. Leslie Keedy, Urban Forester. Thank you for accommodating the applicant. Uh, this is my staff presentation. easy. Okay, um, this is 233 Union Street, appeal of the Parks and Recreation Commission approval of ap application 230005 to approve two coast redwood trees. This would be the first tree that is uh, facing the home located on the west side of the building. Staff finding for tree number one, the redwood tree is healthy, vigorous, and of normal size and color. The trunk is sound and solid. There are no insects or d disease present. Continued staff findings number one, the tree is causing damage to drainage and drainage problems and flooding of the basement. There are roots that are underneath the structure of the home. A bio barrier, which is a root barrier containment product, was installed in the past in an effort to retain the tree and the barrier has been breached and roots are continuing to damage the home. This was prior to the applicant taking the paving stones or the bricks up so I could actually view the root barrier to see if roots had breached that root barrier and to uh, determine if there were roots that likely were causing damage and flooding in the basement area. This is the flooding that was coming into the structure during the winter rains in the basement area for the tree on the west side of the building. This is the biobarrier product that was installed, and you can see that roots are either going under or through that root containment device that was installed in the past. This would be the tree that is on the east side of the building. This is tree number two. Tree number two findings, redwood tree is healthy, vigorous, and of normal size and color. The trunk is sound and solid. It is co-dominant, which means it develops from one brute mass but into two different trunks at approximately 10 feet above grade. Um, and when the tree is splitting or divided into two trunks above grade, it's uh, considered to be one tree by standard industry definition. And there are no insects or disease present on this tree. Staff findings continued on tree number two. The tree is in contact with the house. The tree has eliminated access to the utility closet and the door cannot be opened all the way for necessary access. The tree is in contact with the gas supply line for the home and could represent a hazard. The tree has impacted the site drainage system for the home. 
The tree has cracked the interior sheetrock, which has also been repaired at this time. And the tree is putting pressure on the exterior siding of the home as the tree is in contact. This is the tree in contact with the building. This is a closer uh, image of the tree in contact. Um, the first arrow on the top of the screen uh, represents the contact with the gas supply line for the home. The arrow in the middle of the image is showing the pressure that the tree is putting on the siding of the building. And the image of the lower arrow is pointing at a clean out, which is for the drainage system to convey water around the property. And the tree is impacting the drainage system for that structure. This is the utility closet. That's the max of how that opens. And the utility closet is um, something that hypothetically should be accessible. It um, has, I believe, the water heater and some other essential infrastructure items for the home. Staff findings for both trees, number one and two. There are no reasonable mitigation options to save these two trees. Um, mitigation has been attempted in the past on the first tree with a root containment barrier system, and um, that has failed. The trees are too close to the home. Root pruning without um, destabilizing the tree is not possible. Um, when you look at ISA or uh, International Society of Arboriculture findings, you look at the diameter of the tree, and ideally you want to root prune five times the diameter away from the tree, or three times at a minimum upon arborist approval. Um, these trees are virtually in contact with the home, um, the tree on the east more so than the tree on the west. But um, there's no way to root prune to save the structure without taking all the roots off and causing possibly the trees to be destabilized um, or removing so much roots that, um, I mean, destabilizing obviously is the primary concern, but when you're root pruning that close to the trunk, it also has adverse health consequences to the tree. Um, and then also, um, trees are relatively young in their age in the scheme of redwoods. Redwoods are um, very old living you know, trees that might lo live 2,000 years in nature. And um, they can grow anywhere between you know, four feet in diameter and limited urban conditions up to 20 feet in diameter. And so really, these trees are already um, causing damage to the structure. There's really nowhere for them to continue to increase in diameter and girth. Um, so they'll continue um, to cause damage, uh, structural damage, as they increase in diameter. Recommendation that the City Council uphold the Parks and Rec Commission decision to approve Heritage Tree Permit Removal Application 23005 to remove the two coast redwoods as required by the City Council resolution. And this is the uh, Municipal Code uh, resolution as I as staff do my job. Um, so in this case, uh, these are the findings. And in this case, uh, both heritage trees have or are likely to have an adverse effect upon the structural integrity of the building and the utility. And um, not in this case is there a sidewalk or a public or private right-of-way damage, but there is a private walkway that has been disrupted for the public right-of-way. But the real issue here is structural integrity of the building. And in your information, you'll have a report from a structural engineer. And uh, structural integrity is really, and I'm not an engineer, I'm an arborist, but uh, anything that is a structural member of the house would be something that supports the tree, or the, the root, <laughs> supports the, the home, such as uh, roof eaves, or joists, or the foundation. Um, so um, there's a structural opinion from an engineer in your packet as well as two additional arborist opinions to support the staff recommendation as a certified arborist. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keedy. This is now the opportunity for Elise Casby to present your appeal. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley. I just want to say my co-appellant is Marv Lewis. Um, he's going to present first. We're going to share the time. And uh, he'll take it away now, if that's OK. Thank My you. understanding is we have 15 minutes for our that presentation. OK, yes. thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Council. Uh, so I'm looking to see a PowerPoint on my behalf. One slide. And, uh, Hang on. 
Yeah, just a second. Yeah, just a second here. There we go. All right. Thank you. Uh, and then we're going to begin at 15 minutes. Excellent. Um, is there any way I can see a countdown taking place in this slide? I'll, I'll keep you posted. Uh, I would like I would like the courtesy if I'd be able to see it if possible since we are granting courtesy to Mr. Alvarez for his late appearance. I would like also a courtesy in terms of a simple request. Please show me my time if possible since you have the possible. We'll be glad to do it. Let's do it on the screen. Okay, there we go. I'm fine-tuning myself to your situation here before we begin. And I'm looking for that timer. Okay, time that clock left the clock. Uh, I mean, I, that is so small. I have 20 20 vision. I can okay, look, see it. Uh, uh, look. But what, anyway, it, that aside, uh, let excuse me, begin. me Excuse me, sir. I'm going to give you 15 minutes. We're going to set a timer. I'll keep you posted on how you're doing on time. You ready to go? Outstanding. I'm ready to go. Thank go. you, Mr. Keeley. All right, then. Good afternoon, members of the city council. Please excuse the uh, slightly rough departure as we head into this. Uh, all right. I am here today to address the council uh, regarding the matter of the two coast redwood trees at 233 Union Street. Those trees are in the image. Uh, they're the two centermost trees the left of the larger tree. Um, a mother and her two children may be one way to consider the image. Now, I would like to express my deep concern about the staff report recommending the removal of these trees, and I believe it is essential to discuss the potential implications of this decision. The Heritage Tree Ordinance holds a significant place in our community, reflecting our commitment to Preserving exceptional trees. It is a specific legislation designed to safeguard trees of exceptional value. These trees, such as the majestic coast redwoods, contribute not only to the beauty of our surroundings, but also to the overall well-being of our environment. Now, we, the appellants, strongly disagree with the staff report recommending the denial of the appeal and the removal of the two coast redwood trees at 233 Union Street. We firmly believe that the decision fails to adequately consider the provisions of the Heritage Tree Ordinance, the importance of due process, and the insights provided by Mr. George Berkeley, the previous homeowner. The Heritage Tree Ordinance outlines the criteria and standards for tree removal permits. However, it is crucial to note that the ordinance requires the applicant to establish one or more of the specified findings. The staff report does not sufficiently address whether the applicant has met these requirements. The findings asked to be made under the Heritage Tree Ordinance include adverse effects on the structural integrity of a building, health issues of the trees, or the inability to accommodate existing heritage trees due to construction projects. The report merely states that the heritage trees are causing damage to the foundation of the house without thoroughly examining alternative options for mitigation. Furthermore, the report dismisses the appellant's contention that mitigation is possible and necessary to prevent further damage to the building. Elise Casby, the appellant, expresses a strong belief in the value of these two heritage redwood trees to the wildlife, the neighborhood, and the historical significance of the area. Her argument deserves careful attent consideration. It is essential to remember that the removal of these trees would have a significant impact on the natural beauty and ecological health of the area. Additionally, the report fails to address the issue of due process adequately. In effect, Ms. Casby, the appellant, raised a specific provision of the Heritage Tree Ordinance 9.56. According to this section, the Director of Parks and Recreation has the authority to determine mitigation requirements for approved and unapproved alterations, damage, or removal of heritage tree or heritage shrubs. 
Section 9.5607A outlines the requirement for the Director of Parks and Recreation to consider alternative options for mitigating tree-related issues before approving a removal permit. This provision emphasizes the importance of exploring alternative solutions that may help preserve trees and address concerns rather than resorting to, a tr to tree removal as the primary course of action. Ms. Casby cited this provision to argue that there are feasible alternatives to tree removal, such as implementing a specialized drainage system, as suggested by Mr. George Berkeley, the previous homeowner with substantive engineering expertise. However, in the staff report, the director's denial of the appeal and the recommended tree removal did not thoroughly address Elisa's contention or provide evidence that alternative options were adequately considered. The report merely stated that the trees were causing damage to the foundation without exploring the potential effectiveness of the proposed drainage system or other mitigation measures. Furthermore, it is crucial to address an additional concern raised regarding due process. The appellants were not allowed on the property with a structural engineer to assess the <coughs> alleged damage to the building. Denying them access to the property prevents them from fully examining the situation and providing evidence contrary to the staff's claims. This, this denial of access raises concerns about the fairness and transparency of the decision-making process as it relies on providing an even playing field where all stakeholders can pre present their evidence and perspectives. By addressing this issue, we can uphold the uh, principles of fairness and ensure that the decision regarding the removal of the Coast Redwood trees at 233 Union Street is based on comprehensive and equitable evaluation. Moreover, it is important to consider the insights provided by Mr. George Berkeley, the previous homeowner who installed the specialized drainage system to the property to address the concerns raised by the tree roots. The system has effectively mitigated the impact of the tree roots on the building and the surrounding area. His expertise as an engineer and the success of this drainage system should be taken into account when evaluating the need for tree removal. In examining Mr. Berkeley's detailed testimony, we gained valuable insights into the true cause of the structural integrity issues at 233 Union Street. According to his comprehensive account, the structural issues noted are not caused by the redwood trees, but by a failure to maintain the drainage system. Now, uh, well, further note, just for the point of just moving along here, that uh, the structural engineer suggests specifically that there are mitigation opportunities here, such as just making changes to the basement, et cetera, to accommodate those trees. So this is not a situation where you're being presented with a no options, we have to cut down those trees. Those trees can be situated in such a way relative appropriate mitigation that allows for them not only to continue where they are, but to provide an avenue for an enhanced commercial opportunities within that neighborhood. And I will conclude there and allow my uh, co-compellant here to stand up and further address you. <laughs> Use your time how you wish. Pardon? I say use your time how you wish.
My name is Elise Casby, and you all know me as an activist, and I hope that we can start fresh on this issue because I know that sometimes I express views that uh, are pretty strident. And so I'm hoping we can kind of start with a clean slate here. And thank you all so much. I also want to say thank you to Bonnie and Rosemary Balsley, who really helped me, and Julia. Um, I'm new to this process, and they were really, really helpful. Um, so I just also want to say I submitted a lot of materials to the agenda packet. I hope you all have had a chance to read through those, because I'm not going to focus as much on those technical aspects. I think Marv just covered the legal justifications. Um, I respect uh, Ms. Ke Ms. Keedy, I almost say. Leslie Ke Keedy, not Keeley, Keedy, uh, greatly for her um, expertise. Uh, she's just been a long time urban forester here. Really nice person, took us on to the property the first day. Just total professional, and I just want to say that because Nevertheless, I, I disagree to a large extent with some of her opinion, and I, want, I cannot overstress, I cannot say how difficult it was for us to find a structural engineer. Uh, we had to go through friends' connections when we were very fortunate and lucky to find somebody who was willing to do it. We uh, applied for access to the property and we were denied. I just want to emphasize that, Mayor Keeley and Vice Mayor Golder, because there are a number of things that came up through the appeal process that really show some faults or maybe habits people have gotten into, like not posting the tree appeals. Uh, I just want to say also, many of us are seeing uh, logging trucks every time we cross Mission Street. I cross Mission Street to come down here. I'm downtown a lot. I live up on Story. I take the walking path. And we see fresh cut red, redwood trees all the time. They're not necessarily coming from downtown, obviously, but seven or, uh, something like seven trees were cut recently at Galt Elementary School. They were not noticed by the city. So this is a standard practice. The city is not noticing the trees. Ours were noticed, and we that's how we found out they were um, potentially going to be removed. But I just want to say um, our appeal was not noticed properly. And so Marv went into Tremaine, Tremaine Head and Jones and told him that and more or less held the city accountable. And that resulted in a bunch of difficulty to inconvenience to set up a meeting to have our appeal heard. So I just want to say, I'm told by many activists, this kind of thing is going on all the time. Trees are just cut. Notices are not put up for appeal hearings. So it, we found that we were constantly working against the process, like wanting to work with it but having difficulty. Um, and the biggest one is not being able to get a structural engineer on the property. Having said that, I want to spend the bulk of the rest of my time just saying, I walk through this neighborhood all the time. I live up on Story, which is just on the west side, um, near the intersection of Route 1 and Mission. And I take Green Street. I take the very um, wide ramp that goes up. I don't know if you all know Recon Park is behind here. This is such a jewel of a neighborhood. And the materials I've given you is to try to say, these trees are artifacts. Um, they're so beautiful. They're so... Um, large. They are large and they're impacting the house. Uh, I believe they are in the downtown historic district. I really tried yesterday to find a precise map. It Almost certainly they are, but I couldn't quite find a good map. I did give you a map in there. It's from 1959. Um, but the house is definitely listed on uh, our city website, actually. It's on the historic wet register um, there. So I'm just going to call it that. I just want to say, um, I think that we are right here in the city hall. You can see those trees. That picture is taken from right out there. Um, it's a gorgeous neighborhood. It has immense historic value. There are walking paths, Green Street, the ramp I just mentioned that takes you up to Upper Locust. There's a steep uh, stairway behind the town clock that takes you right to Santa Cruz Mission Historic Park. We've got the post office, which is historic and has that incredible New Deal art. We are sitting on a gem here. And other neighborhoods have been noticed, um, but I don't think this one has. And I just want to say that these trees 
are immensely important. I, I don't want to go on and on about climate change, but in recent years, I sat in on some classes up at UCSC. The impacts that we, we are going to be experiencing with climate change are scary. They're, they're very real, and they will be happening to our children and their children. And trees, I've learned, um, as much as they're just, just trees, really help with um, building resilience for climate change. That's all I want to really say on that. But what I do want to say is because the site is listed on the historic register, because the trees are old, they're probably, Leslie said, between 70 and 80 years old. A docent who spoke at a previous meeting of the commission said they might be old growth. I don't, I don't personally know if they're old growth. I believe that the structural integrity, which is a term that I brought out, I am the one that really um, talked about that at these meetings because Structural integrity, having the trees, uh, the law that they're citing, they need to be clearly having an adverse effect on the structural integrity of the house. They are not right now. They will in the future. And I feel what I'm hoping for is a robust discussion about the trees and their placement in this neighborhood and how we can preserve them. And I just want to end by quickly saying one more thing. Sorry about this, but the engineer's report for the applicant gives the recommendation that there are two recommendations. OK, the second one is protect the existing trees. That would require altering the house. Now, I believe the realtor wants to cut the trees for a quick sale. I've heard that the roots would continue to seek water and structure the uh, damage the front foundation. So I just want to say, this property is for sale. We could buy it. and. The structural engineer who says, protect the existing trees, we could alter this house. We could purchase it. It could potentially even be a museum. It's so close to some of the best shopping on the West Coast, some of the most interesting and amazing walking places. It's close to the beach. Please consider that we need to more fully discuss not only the value of the trees, but the value of the trees in placement with the home. And I'll end with one more sentence. We could have a showcase home, that uh, museum, or what, what you want to call it, that shows how houses can be remodeled to provide for growing redwood trees. We're on the alluvial plain next to the cliffs. It would be awesome if we could really use this as a geological natural artifact and also a uh, commercial gem. Thank you so much for listening to this, and I deeply appreciate it. Thank you very much. This will be the opportunity for Dorth Raffaele to have 15 minutes to speak and provide evidence in support of your application. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Danny Alvarez. I'm the real estate agent and advisor. I'm also a general contractor, a licensed general contractor. And this is Sarah Moore, and she is part one of the owners. Dorth Rafaeli is the other owner. He could not attend. He lives in Sebastopol and has the kids today. So. Um, we, I am the realtor who would love a quick sale, but that's not happening these days uh, because of the market's changing. But that said, um, in order for me to sell this property, any buyer would be, um, have to be blind not to consider what the trees are doing to this house, which is where we started way back in December, January, when we thought about what are we going to do to prepare the house for sale? And so we got an inspection report and a pest inspection report and did all the normal things. And then we had all these atmospheric rivers with these, the downpour like we haven't seen. And the drainage system that she alluded to that we had no knowledge of what it was really all about because Sarah and Dorth bought this property from the bank. So there was no disclosures about anything about a system and all of this and that. Um, the system is working. 
What the problem was, why the water was intruding, if you look at the pictures that she showed, was the brick walkway that was put in originally that had a slope against away from the house was now getting lifted up by this, this redwood back into the house. We had multiple uh, sandbags stacked around this door to prevent that water from coming in and it still leaked like you saw in that photograph. So therein lies the truth of the matter of one side that was an issue. So we then went to and applied to Leslie Keedy for the removal because it felt like these two trees, the other one is even more clearly affecting the house. We did hire a structural engineer at great expense to come to the house and do a report that you saw. The two options she gave you is remove the trees or remodel the house. Now that sounds simple, but to remodel the house for the trees would be a major project, including altering the foundations and in, in, in going inside the house to make room for these trees that are 40 to 60 years old is what we heard, not 80 to 90. And it doesn't matter. That's still infantile in the scope of a redwood tree. So Leslie came out. She saw it. And so when she approved it and she saw the bricks the way they were, uh, they went ahead and removed the brick because the, the, the tree cutter was going to grind the roots down too. You have to do that to prevent it from keep growing. So we took the bricks out of the way because they have to grind all around it, plus it had lifted up some other wood. And so we cleared it all up, and that's when we saw the proof in the photograph that you saw, the big root going underneath the house. That, to me, and it breached the barrier that was put in with this other gentleman who owned it, two owners previous, who put the tree guard on Leslie's recommendation that he should do that. God bless him, he tried, it didn't work. The root, you can see clearly in the photograph, the root is going underneath the house and the root's about that big. So we moved forward, we went to the commission. I give credit to the passion that the appellant has for saving trees. Um, I get it, we are not anti-tree, we are pro our property, her property, their property, and the value of that property. And if we are not given the right to do this, the value of that property is gonna go down because it is now a real issue that no one is gonna really wanna take on. And that, to me, points to the actual damage being caused by these two trees. I have a buyer who wants to put an offer in if the trees are removed, if they're not, she's not interested. What does that tell you? So with that said, uh, we did, after the commission hearing, which went four to three, we went and hired two more arborists because the argument that she didn't bring up today that she brought in the last time was that it was three trees. And the onus for three trees is much more challenging than two trees. So we have two other arborists that came in, they looked at the trees, and you have their reports, and they both made a statement to that effect of what defines a tree. The structural engineer, was their other argument that the, what is structural integrity and structural damage? So we did that by hiring a structural engineer to come out. And with regards to not allowing them to see the property, it was asked on the last evening prior to the deadline, and two, it's not her property, it's not her house, it's not her tree, it is her house and her tree. And she does not have to give her permission to come do anything on her property. That's, we feel strongly about that. That's a right of hers. And to ask, and like she did, she went to file this complaint in the very beginning on the 10th day, literally in the 11th hour at 4.30. She filed it. She did the same thing, trying to get permission to come on the night before. And even if she had come three days earlier, we would have said no. There's, I asked Leslie, do I have to do this? Do they have to do this? And there's no, uh, but yes, we told in our email that the city council could go. 
so you could see for yourselves. We were clear that you guys had permission to look at these trees. And I hope you did, because if you did see them, I think you would see clearly these trees are causing damage. Inside the house, in fact, I didn't even know this as much until the structural engineer came. On the tree, as you face it to the left, the one that's bulging into the side over the gas line, inside the house, you can see the walls getting deflected. It's not straight. It's literally bending where that tree root is. And I hadn't even noticed that before because I never you know, did that look, and she did. And she goes, oh, yeah, you can see there's deflection happening right now. It's like, so with that, I'll let Sarah say just a few words she'd like to. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, on that note as well, um, with giving them, you know, the appellant's permission to come see the property, um, they had all, all blatantly trespassed several times and were open about it in our first um, county meeting. And um, they'd seen it plenty without any permission, and that was part of my decision too. Um, anyway, my, I'm just here to um, say I just want the law upheld. Um, that's all I'm asking for. Um, we've paid our taxes diligently. We've um, put so much into this house, um, all new fencing, new painting, interior remodel with respect to its age. Um, the whole reason I personally wanted this place 10 plus years ago was um, its historic value being from 1849. Um, it's a very, very old house and very special, and I feel like I've brought it back to life and honestly had no idea about the issues going on underneath the ground until this all happened, um, and we did maintain the drainage. Um, at one point, it was having issues, and we had it cleaned out, and our tenants, we had a very good relationship with, said, we will let you know if there's any more issues. It was, it was very obvious when there were issues, um, and everything has been working properly. That previous owner, George Hamilton, never heard a hide or hair of him in all these years. Um, if you put in this elaborate system, it would have been nice to know that. I don't know if it would have fixed this problem, but okay. I'm going to let the neighbors say a couple words. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I've never done this before. This is a little nerve-wracking. So my name is Rebecca. I love trees, totally adore trees. I'm a, a runner. I run up in the um, Henry Cal all the time. I even know some trees, like I have personal names for them. But I live next door at 235 Union, and I would just love for those two trees to be taken out. Um, they, we're worried, too, about the roots and et cetera, and the... Um, and they're a little messy and all that, but I mean, I love them. And I have that huge oak tree on our property. It's gonna help the oak tree grow. I mean, there's kind of a win there. So I just wanted to put in my two cents that I am all for taking those two trees out. I think that's it. Okay, so I wanna be very clear. You, you now are completed. You have 10, you have five more minutes, but you're going to now seed that? Are you going to not use that? Is that right? We're, we're not going to use it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure we're clear with each other on that. Let me uh, ask council members if they have questions on this. Well, let me then uh, seek public comment on this uh, application. Anyone with us today who wishes to make comment on this appeal? Is there anyone online who wishes? Ms. Bush, is there anyone online? No, there are not. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Certainly. Uh, I believe we're getting some rebuttal time. Five minutes and a few. Yes. Okay, thank yes, you. you. Will. Um, I just want to say that we're counting on Mr. Berkeley to speak during that time. So is it okay if he also speaks during public comment? Yes. Well, what we'd like to do, are you the rebuttal? Uh, is that. I'm the previous owner. Okay. Well, I, uh, let me ask the. Let me ask you. Yeah. What is your intent with regard to the five minutes that you've got? Okay. Remaining. Uh, my understanding was that not right now, but 
a little later in the appeal, we get five minutes to do That's a rebuttal. Correct. And I'm hoping that Mr. Berkeley will take three of those five minutes at that time. And uh, that's what I'm really asking um, is. You can use that five minutes any way you want. But if you're gonna, going to ask the gentleman, if you're going to give him three of your five minutes, that's fine with me. You can do it right. any way you want. It, but that'll be when we'll accept your testimony. Then. But that's not right now, correct? That that's, is correct. That's a little later. And so I think you would ask long. for public comment. And so My I guess is we're doing a lot of this talk, and we're going to get to you in just a minute. So have a seat. We'll be right with you. Okay. We're good. Uh, but you had asked for public comment, and I think he might also want to make comments as a public member of the public, and that's also what I'm just asking. Let me see if there are anybody else who wants to make public comment on this. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, Vice Mayor Golden, Council and staff, um, Gillian Greenside. And I attended the um, Parks and Recreation Commission meeting on this. But first of all, let me just say that um, Obviously, this is a. You know, um, some may see this very clearly. Some may see this as uh, um, needs some more thought. So I just want to add a few points for you to consider as you weigh this issue. First of all, we are lo we are losing a lot of heritage trees. The last time numbers were made public, it's about thirty heritage trees a month are cut down with permit many um, also unknown without permit. And there are very few appeals. I have done a f just about a handful in my uh, 40 years of trying to save our big trees, and we've lost nearly all of them in my neighborhood. And I bring that up because uh, I know the issue is focused on structural integrity, if the trees are causing a, um, an adverse effect on the structural integrity of a building, and that's why a uh, structural engineer is important. And the vote, um, I'm glad that the applicant mentioned that, because it isn't mentioned in the staff report. The vote was initially a tie, and then at, at the subsequent meeting it was four to three, but the three who voted to uphold the appeal didn't see evidence at that time that there was an impact on the structural integrity. And so I think it was a real shame that the appellant was not allowed to bring a structural engineer on site. I say that with no disrespect to their structural engineer, who I don't know, but I know with myself when I was up against the Seaside Company on a tree on Beach Street, and their structural engineer said it was lifting the foundation of the house so it was out of plumb. It went to the Planning Commission, because it's in the coastal zone, I was the appellant, and Mark Masiti Miller, who's an engineer, who was the chair of the commission, he'd gone and put his uh, level on it. He said there's no sign at all of it lifting the house. So the point there is that it is important to have structural engineers from both perspectives, because it's sort of known that... Uh, you know, if you're paying the structural engineer, it's very rare that you don't find reasons, but they need to be counterbalanced. I was at the meeting and did not uh, at all hear any crowing about we've trespassed on the property. So I see times running out. I think that the drainage issue is important. I think that uh, the comment about the roots touching the gas line, I'll just wind up with this. Um, talk to Lee Brokaw, he'll tell you about gas lines are very flexible and that could be accommodated. And the comment was that that is of architectural concern, not structural concern. So didn't have time to go through it all. Thank you. I hope you will consider those points as you deliberate this difficult issue. Thank you. Anyone else? Three minutes. minutes. I'm George Berkeley. I'm the previous owner of 233 Union Street. Could you Mine. move the microphone just a little closer? Oh, sorry. Very okay. good. Thank you, yeah, sir. I'm George Berkeley. I'm previous owner of 233 Union Street. I installed the drainage system 
um, that was not maintained. Um, the statement that uh, the drainage system was cleaned out once in 13 years is proof that it wasn't maintained. The drainage system needs to be cleaned out um, every year. And there's two components to the drainage system. There's a, the surface drainage system, and then there's the subsurface drainage system that goes to the base of the footing of the foundation. But if that drainage system had been maintained properly, the house would not have been flooded. I designed that system to withstand a 100-year storm, and then my, um, the engineer gave me specifications for a pump and doubled that, and then I added more to the specification. That even though the water, the, the bricks are being lifted up and going towards the house, the, dra the subsurface drainage system, it was capable of taking all that water away. It's, it's well over-designed. The Santa Cruz could <laughs> be washed away, and that house would still be there if the drainage system had been maintained properly. Um, uh, Let's see, what else? The other thing is I did not install the root barrier um, because my to, uh, to, to prevent it from hitting the house, I installed the root barrier to prevent the roots from going in to the subsurface uh, uh, French drain chamber to the corrugated pipe and clogging up the drainage system. And my civil engineer specified a filter fabric, which I installed, but, and then, so there was no requirement that I put a, the bio barrier, but I added that instead. Um, also, the picture in the report from the city of urban forester says that the root is penetrating uh, the foundation. I went and looked at it, and the, the root that looks like it's penetrating the foundation just actually goes right up to the barrier and stops. You could put, put a sheet of paper between it and, and the filter fabric that protects the, the French drain chamber. So that it is not penetrating the house. Um, wow, I still have some more time. So those, those are two incorrect facts that I, that um, the, the bio barrier was to protect the foundation, so it was to protect the um, drainage system. And that the drain, and also uh, the building inspector report says that the GFCI that feeds the, the sump pump is not resetting properly. So the pump is not getting power, according to the report, uh, the building inspector's report. And I'd hesitate to see if you pulled off the cover to the sump chamber. Um, I would expect it to be filled with debris. It should have been cleaned out every year. And that's why it backed up in, into the house, not because the drainage, the drainage system is not working. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who is here in chambers wish to provide a comment? This will be the opportunity for Ms. Gatsby for you to, this would be your opportunity to provide. Just to be clear on the public comments. She gets to rebuttal. Do you, do we get a rebuttal to her rebuttal? No. No. Then I have a, one public comment. The system didn't fail. It drained. That was not the problem with the water getting in the house. That that was not the issue. The issue was the bricks lifted up by the tree, and the water going in. This drainage system works great. Tree lifted up, bricks came in, water went into the house. That's what happened. Ms. Caspi, this would be your opportunity. Thank you all. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that I took on the appeal. I, was, I came to see Julia at 3 o'clock, before 3, because I know that the city offices sometimes close at 3. I was over in the Parks and Recreation Office long before 3.30. I was going to file my appeal right away. I've never filed an appeal before. Uh, I was asked by Tremaine Hen Jones if Miss Leslie Keaty could come and take me on to the property. I said, sure. I want to see it close up. I will say that I went 
um, to the property many times. I went with George to look at the drainage system. It's totally clogged up. It has not been maintained. So, but I am not a lawbreaker. <laughs> I do civil disobedience. I was not doing any civil disobedience. I very much wanted to uh, obey the law and not trespass. I have been canvassing the neighborhood, so I've been walking by on the sidewalk. Um, I've been posting, uh, I've been looking at the posted notices and taking pictures all around, and I wish I had the skills to really share those pictures with you. I have, my respect for people who do these presentations has just gone up logarithmically, and I really wish that I could have done that. Nevertheless, I've provided you with some pictures, and it's nearby. If we could, if we are able to have a more robust discussion, I would love to do that. Leslie did come down. I waited until about 4 o'clock. Um, she went and showed me the property. I wanted to file the appeal because I wanted to get it in on time. I absolutely did. And one of the reasons that I waited on this, by the way, is because I was hoping that somebody else would do it. I don't ha I have never done anything like this before. But I got it in on time. And the same with all the requests I've made. Um, there's things I need to do better and that I've learned from. But I just wanted to say that because I kind of am offended that I'm being accused of trespassing when, in fact, I would have liked to have gone and, and looked at some things, but I did not. So the other thing I just want to say is structural integrity is an incredibly important concept. Ms. Keedy has picked it up from my appeals to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Structural integrity of the house is like the foundation, the main beams, the walls, so that if the house sustains things like hurricanes and earthquakes, hopefully it's strong enough that it's not going to fall. It's not the furnace closet where the water heater is. By the way, Leslie and I were both in there. You can open the door. You can move the gas line. The duff that's between the biggest tree on the east side and the house is substantial. It hasn't been, the duff is what falls from the trees in the dirt. I'm just saying that right now, in terms of the law that they are citing, the applicant, this, these trees are not having uh, adverse effect on the structural in, in, integrity now. Unfortunately, the law does say the trees could be removed if they're likely to, and that's where the difficulty is. Through my work in canvassing on this issue, I was able to contact also not just Mr. Berkeley, who uh, was a former jet propulsion expert and installed this incredible drainage system to the tune of $125,000 because it's on an alluvial plane. If we were to preserve these trees, that would work in our favor because the drainage system discourages the trees from going under the house. Now, the tenant, who is there something like eight years, owns a tea shop nearby. He did not want to be named, but I interviewed him. He said the trees are not causing any damage to that house. The window frames are old. They're broken. If you look at the uh, investi the report, um, inspection report, it talks about all these things. The tea man lived there with his family. He said the water was coming under the front door. The gasket, he called it a gasket, was not there. The trees are not causing the flooding, and that is the point of Mr. Berkeley's testimony, that the trees are not causing the flooding. What I'm asking you all to do is to think about the spirit of this law. This is like the Endangered Species Act. This is like the Clean Air Act. California is one of the only states to have this law. But as we are in the climate change era, we need to really consider resilience of our communities. I don't want to scare you all, but it's, it's real. These trees are an incredible cultural artifact. The pathways and connections to all the mission sites and the historical sites and the house, which is a historical, historical uh, on this historical registry, go with the trees. They deserve more thoughtful consideration. Please give us the time to really consider taking down these trees. They can be preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Ms. Bush, anyone online? Uh, nobody. No? Thank you. All right. 
Matter is back before the council for questions and actions. Council members have questions or comments on this. Ms. Bruner. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let me pull up my notes here. Um, I have some questions. So, um, in reading, there were a lot of documents to read through. Thank you to everyone who submitted documents and information. It was actually quite interesting to read through and understand um, here. And I think the structural engineer's report was exactly what I was thinking before I dove into the information, remove the trees or remove the, the building. And that was the result of that structural engineer's report, essentially. Um, there is, uh, I'm not a structural engineer, so I can only go by the professional um, certified reports of the arborists, the three different arborists and the structural engineer um, and the information they're providing. Um, there were several statements about um, the trees do not have impact on the structural integrity um, from the appellant and the, the co-appellant, the previous owner, um, but there's a report that says it does. So I, I'm not one to decide what's accurate other than a statement versus a professional opinion and report. Um, so I have to go by the data. So I'm just, my question is um, this, there were, on the appellants, I'm trying, I, I fully agree with our trees and um, preserving trees. Thank you for, um, you know, taking this on and you, you mentioned the first time. Um, and so my question is, I didn't really feel a sense of um, data other than opinion and statement on the appellant side to support that uh, the tree was not having structural integrity on the building. And um, so I just want to make sure that there is no, no further data that you want to call out the, on that other than a statement? I guess that's my question. <laughs> I'm trying to understand where that data is. I just want to say that um, if you look at the property, if you are on the property, if you really look at the property and then the pictures, if you talk to the former tenant, he just moved out at the end of February, and unless it was the end of January. He's very clear that there that there was no flooding in the house until this winter and where it came through. I would just say also to bring up the point quickly and then I'll defer to him. We, we went to some trouble to try to uh, retain the services of a structural engineer and we were gonna have to do it pro bono. Mm -hmm. A friend of ours who's been at these hearings knew I was looking and she was having a conversation with a woman who said, Shelly, I am a structural engineer. And so that's why we tried to gain access to the property. And admittedly, it was late in the process. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to call into question here in the spirit of the Heritage Tree Ordinance is, you know, private property is fair. It, there's boundaries and rights that need to be upheld out of respect for the property and the owner and liability and everything else. These, this Heritage Tree Act, I think really requires for it to really have any kind of uh, effect. We need to have reasonable accommodation. I went on the property with Leslie Keaty, the urban forester. I did not go on the property. When George and I looked at the pump, we were outside. He took me to the back alley, Angle Alley, which is right over there. So I'm going to defer to Marv, but just, we did me. not have excuse any me. hard excuse data. Excuse me yeah. for just a second. Yeah. Did you get the answer to your question? Unless you have, um, you can call out uh, supporting data that shows that there is not. 
Yeah, I, I'll just impact I'll very, to the structural integrity of the building. Yeah, I'll be I'll be very very brief here. Uh, you know, I agree with you, and uh, you're absolutely right. They have a structural engineer, and there's a professional position on behalf of both the city and the owners. We do not have that. We ha what we do have is the experience of the owner, and we have hearsay from the previous uh, tenant. Now, that's an issue, but it's as well an issue because it illustrates an uneven playing field between people that have a vested interest in living in this community, between business owners that surround it, that want to uh, experience the opportunity of these trees and the tourists they bring in, et cetera, and the owners that are able, by nature of the ordinance, to essentially s emphasize their position to the disadvantage of people that are the appellants in this case. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question. Um, and we don't have the structural engineer here to answer any of those further questions, but um, the claim of the drainage system working great, um, which was stated by the, the realtor and not working great as stated by the former owner and appellant. And so again, um, the current owner and the current um, uh, realtor, if, if you could come forward and just, or you're the previous owner. I'm the previous owner. I'm the one who stated the drainage system's pump is failing. Here's what we do. Yeah. Excuse me. So I'm, Hold on just a second now. Thank you. The council, the council I just want to ask a question to a specific person. I just want to understand um, if the drainage not working or working has a direct correlation on the structural impact, the impact of the structural integrity of the building. So, so I'll repeat at the time the water was entering the house, the drainage system was not clogged, it was working. It wasn't backing up out of the drainage system. The water that got in the house was because the amount of rain, as Sarah previously had mentioned, they had serviced it once in the 13 years they owned it, how, and, and it worked. It never clogged up, but the trees had lifted up the brick, as the photo showed you, and the, the amount of rain we were getting, which everybody remembers was heavy, heavy this December, January, was coming towards the house because of the tree roots that had lifted up the bricks, which Leslie showed you in their photograph right. of before we removed the bricks. So this drainage issue is like, look over here, this is not the problem. The drain is, they want to say it's all because of the drainage. It's Forget the drainage. The bricks got lifted by the tree. The tree has a big root. There's a photograph when we pulled the bricks up. Voila, big root going right into the under the house photograph. You all could have gone by, I wished you had, because you, if you'd seen for yourself, you would, could see very clearly. I, uh, I've all, been all by, oh, yes, great. Okay. thank you. Anyway, so the drainage system is, is not, I don't know why they keep bringing it up like that's the issue. It's not the issue. And it has, I just want to know professionally if there's data to support that has no correlation to this tree and the tree roots and not servicing it if there's a well, there if anybody no, there can there was answer no reason that to, in a professional well there's no reason to address the drainage system because no one ever said we're having a problem with the drainage system they want to say we did but there wasn't in our opinion there was no issue the drainage worked the problem was the bricks had got lifted the amount of rain, it, this is the first time it's leaked since they owned it, from, except for the first year they bought it, 13 years ago, it leaked. And the tenant will testify to that, whatever. But since then, and this atmospheric downpour, because the amount of volume of rain, the house water, the water came down and the surface did matter. It didn't get, there wasn't enough time for water to, to leach into the, the, under the bricks, it was just sheeting into the house because of the bricks lifted up from the tree root. From the tree, tree roots. root, and that's the that's the proof of the issue of the problem we had. And again, I'll repeat: yeah. we had probably 15 sandbags up against that door 
trying to it prevent just, this. I, I, you know, in the report, I, I read through that, and I just want to make clear for my understanding yeah. that I am informed when making this decision. Sure, sure. Because it, it is being brought up, and I want to, and I am not someone who goes and inspects houses no. and foundations and tree roots, so I need to rely on the professional reports that are, and data that's provided um, that states no. their So the, the one issue was the slope? going towards the house, we pulled the bricks up because we thought we were gonna be cutting the trees because we got the permission to do so. We pulled up the bricks, dug down, and saw Great. what you also saw. For that answers my question. One last question. Um, the, the comment or question um, about alternatives and the appellant mentioned that um, suggested alternatives were not addressed. Um, there was mention of a specialized drainage system or other mitigation measures. Um, I don't know what other, and there was, uh, in my notes, um, reference to our, our code, 9.5670A, outlining requirements for Parks and Rec Director to consider alternate options before removal. And I just want to clarify with the city attorney if that indeed is a requirement, and if that did happen, if it is. Well, as I read the reports, the, the two arborist reports in the file, as well as the engineer's report, and as I understood the testimony of the city arborist, those alternatives were explored, such as root pruning, putting in barriers, and were deemed not feasible. I would also, just based on my reading of the evidence, uh, it suggests that the water intrusion into the house is only one of the problems. Right. Um, the, the tree is in physical contact with the side of the house and, and the foundation and appears to be moving them. So I think that's the basis for the, uh, the argument in support of the structural integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you. So I actually have a question for the applicants, the um, real estate agent and the property owner. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess I'm, I'm, so I think Council Member Bruner is, is convinced, but I am not convinced based on what I've heard. Um, I'm hearing assertions. I, I, um, I'm hearing conflicting points of view. And I have seen the arborist reports and the structural engineer reports. I've read those thoroughly. I've, I'm around this area all the time. I know the property well. Um, I've read it all. Um, and I guess what I want to ask you is, um, given that um, this is, you know, a question that requires us to make a decision based on evidence, and I don't feel like I have enough, if you could just explain why a, you've, you've asserted the, the property right argument for not allowing an additional inspection with a, an alternative structural engineer. Um, and that's not to say your structural engineer wasn't an expert or is biased, but that was your structural engineer you hired for a particular purpose to get rid of these trees. Um, and so I'm just wondering, aside from it's your property right, was there a reason to not have that additional um, inspection so that we maybe could have um, a little bit more um, of that evidence rather than um, kind of conflicting, I, what I feel are conflicting assertions. Um, I recognize the drainage is not the only issue, but I have heard multiple, I'm just going to explain why I'm asking you to clarify this for me. I heard um, from the property owner, we didn't even know about the drainage system. Um, we would have do been doing things about it if we had known. Um, I hear you, sir, saying it's been working just fine, as if you knew. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm just confused a little bit about, um, you know, where where that that's at, um, and I, I guess I guess again that, that's just my context. But the real question is why was there any other reason? What are the reasons that you didn't want to have another engineer look at it? I find that having a range of opinion would help us um, make a decision, and I don't feel um, like I have that as a result of that denial. So we have. 
three arborist reports. That's a pretty good range. We have one structural engineer is, who's not our, it's a public one that we called. Um, and uh, we feel like the evidence was plenty. She called on the evening of the uh, 12 o'clock before the deadline next morning to get on the property to do this. This was something that we had to think about in terms of insurance and who and what and everything else that we had to consider. Um, quite honestly, um, there had been a lot of trespassing before and we felt like they had violated the owners. They were very upset with them about all the things they had done. And this, everything about this drain is, is just, and they're, they're grasping for straws to try to find any way to create any doubt, and they've done a great job of doing it. But the evidence is clear in three arborist reports and one structural engineer's report that has two recommendations, either move the house or move the trees. So, you know, whose side are you going to go there on that? You want to protect the, the tree, then that means we have to move the house, and that's not what the ordinance speaks to. Okay, so I think you've answered my question. It sounds like you, you just didn't want to get that because you feel like you're, you didn't have to and you feel like what was done was sufficient. Well, so you I just asked, didn't want to do that. I asked if, that. We, if there was anything that, would, uh, that we were having to do that, and, and uh, Leslie said no. There's no requirement. Right. Okay, so you, so, so you weren't required. So and we were not required. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. I thought the evidence was totally overwhelming and the second structural engineer was unnecessary. Um, honestly, having um, the city arborist come out and have overwhelming evidence was enough to me. And also just the fact that just looking at the laws and looking at trees and seeing that it's likely going to ruin the house. I mean, it already is in my opinion, but just reading the laws, it seemed overwhelming to me and unnecessary. And um, there were like lots of lies and assumptions about us as owners in previous meetings and I just was kind of over it. Um, speaking to the drainage, um, our tenants um, were very on top of it and um, we had a constant conversation about, to them about it and we said if, they said it needs to get cleaned out and we talked to the people who cleaned it out and they said it's working well. No one ever mentioned a yearly maintenance, no one. So. The tenant said, trust us, because it's our property, you know, <laughs> and we had the funds to um, maintain it. You know, we were, we were always open to maintaining it. That, um, it was never a financial thing. And um, he said, trust me, I will let you know if it's not working well, because it's very obvious when it's not. And he even said, now that I know how the drainage system works, I will work to maintain it. And he would constantly be taking stuff out of it and watching it. That was our relationship with the drainage system. Um, so to the best of our abilities, we maintained it. And it didn't fail when it leaked. The, there was no backwater coming out of it. The drainage system was working when the water leaked into the house. Further questions, comments? Right, motion would be in order. I would like to move the stack recommendation. Um, I'm trying to see what to uh, deny the appeal and uphold the Parks and Recreation Commission's approval of the tree removal application two three dash zero zero five. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion and second under discussion. <laughs> Debate or discussion on this item? I have a Ms. Brown. Um, thank you. Um, I am not going to be able to support this motion. I um, am with the three members of the Parks and Rec Commission who had concerns about this. I, I don't believe that um, the, um, that a really good faith was, effort was made on the part of uh, the property owners who were um, making a move that it seems to me is one of expediency um, to sell a property with minimum impediment and maximum profit. That's your right to do that. It's your property. Um, but we also have an ordinance that um, causes us to make decisions about um, 
trees, which are of public benefit to our entire community. And the fact that, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, we you got the the reports that said here's what's going on, and there is some I believe some legitimate dispute about that, which could potentially have been, um, in my mind, resolved had there been um, other eyes on it, not hired by the property owner who has a very clear interest. That's your right to have that interest. But I believe other interests should also um, have access to give us information to make those decisions. So I can't support the denial. I would, um, I, I would support this appeal and ask for um, some additional, or I, I would support moving forward um, to, to postpone until we get that information and direct that happen um, as an alternative. Um, but I'm, not expecting that to um, <laughs> happen and be made as a motion, so I'm just going to say that, and I will be voting no. Thank you. Councilmember Brunner. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Arborist uh, Kitty for your information and answering questions. Uh, and I just want to say, in, in for me making this decision, it's, it's not easy, and we we have adopted a climate action plan. We are really taking seriously this tree ordinance, and um, you know our green spaces and preserving where we can. Um, I do want to um, just call out the uh, structural engineers' report um, in really what uh, I'm pulling up my notes. One second. Um, what really stood out for me is um, the options um, and whether or not that um, it's private or selling or what the action of the owners of the property or the building, whatever they're doing with it, the issue is still there. And so in, in case of the, um, uh, the professional engineer and the recommendations, remove the building or remove the trees, in removing the buildings uh, or part of the building, they even mentioned it would require redesign, rebuild, remodel um, existing structure, relocate water heaters, basement access, redesign, repair, surface drainage, uh, reroute gas lines, and due to the historic nature of the historic building and the limited lot size and what that require might not be viable. And so I think, you know, we have to take all of the context into consideration. And so I will be supporting this um, denial of the appeal, and um, thank you, everyone, for the information and the data. The vice mayor is recognized. I just, I want to say I appreciate the ordinance, I appreciate the appellants, and I know um, that you worked really hard on this, and I, I, I also think, I can speak for all of us, that we, we like the spirit of the ordinance, we like having trees in our town, and I appreciate the good work that you constantly do for the city, um, uh, Leslie. And I grew up in Bonnie Dune, and I don't think redwood trees are really good next to homes. And the house has been here since, what did we say, 1848, and the trees are only, at most, 90 years old. I'd rather move the trees in this instance. And they're touching the house. And so that, it's pretty much simple as that. The pictures speak for themselves, in my opinion, even without having, and I did read, but even before reading the report, just the pictures alone, sorry, you know, no one's going to buy this house. A bank might not even lend on this house with the trees where they are. I just want to be realistic. And so, yeah, that's where I'm at. For the question or comment, Council Member Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, and I uh, just want to say as well, I, I appreciate uh, the concerns of the appellants uh, for these two coastal redwood trees. And as I said, these two majestic coastal redwood trees. Uh, but uh, as Council Member uh, Bruner um, I said, and I'll echo you know, the, the opinion of uh, four experts who had eyes on the on the property, three arborists and a structural engineer was that uh, the trees were impacting the uh, property and with the structural engineer determining that the trees pose an immediate threat to the existing structure. Uh, and the trees are pushing up against a um, gas line as well in the home, which has posed a public safety issue for uh, the neighborhood as well. So uh, that is why I su support uh, the motion. Other questions, comments? 
Well, we have 272 pages of material on this. Um, appeal's been heard by the Parks Commission. Now it's been heard by the full council. Um, I think whether it's uh, an appeal from any decision of any body that finds its way here or litigation in a courtroom or everything, anything else, uh, it's not always the case that everybody has sort of uh, equal information that they provide. Uh, the appellant provided such information as you could gain access to. Uh, the folks who own the property, you have information that, that you put together. I don't think it's a flaw in the process that somebody might have a structural engineer report and somebody else might not. That's not a flaw in the process. That's a That could be a resource issue available to the appellant versus the other party, but it's not a flaw in the system as I see it. Uh, if this had less information than the 272 pages of information here, lots of reports, maybe that's a, maybe this is a closer call. I don't see this as a close call. What I see it is that we have a heritage tree ordinance exactly for this reason, so that we are very careful as a city when we grant uh, the permit to take a tree down. Uh, no, no surprise to anybody who knows where I live. I have an absolutely massively beautiful uh, heritage tree in my front yard that if it was gone would change not only my yard, but would change actually a lot of the neighborhood. It really would. Uh, and I know we fall deeply in love with our trees as well we should. Uh, I don't think this is a capricious act by the property owner. Gee, let me just see how quickly I can take a couple of trees down. I think it's much more complicated than that for the property owner. Um, I think that the appeal is a, is a well-reasoned appeal. I think you make a good argument, a good set of arguments. They're not good enough for me to vote for it, uh, for, for where you want to go with this. But I think you made a good, you, uh, a, a very good appeal. The record is replete with a lot of information in it. So I'll be supporting the motion that's on, on, on the floor at this time. Of course, for the questions or comments, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson's absent. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all very much for being here. We are on, we just hold for one second here. Uh, check our, yeah. We are on item number 27. This is an ordinance amending select portions of chapter 10.40 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code pertaining to parking of, of odor, oversized vehicles. We'll have a staff presentation and we'll wait. thank you, Ms. Keedy, for your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Butler, good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and council members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the city, and I've got a brief presentation for you that Bonnie is going to pull up. Um, we're talking about some changes to the oversized vehicle ordinance, and there are three changes that are under consideration. They're all very minor. The first one is related to um, oversized vehicles parked within 100 feet of uh, intersections. The second is related to um, uh, oversized vehicle ordinance implementation. You can go ahead to the next slide, Bonnie. Thank you. Um, the next slide, Bonnie. Thanks. <clears throat> the uh, emergency declarations and the implementation of the ordinance during emergency declarations and the final is related to residential parking permits. I'll briefly outline each of those. Um, so the council will recall the uh, ordinance that was approved back in uh, 2021 included a provision that, pre that prevented oversized vehicles from parking within 100 feet of intersections. Um, the Coastal Commission, when the uh, Coastal Permit implementing that ordinance went before them, um, took issue with that provision and um, their um, no substantial issue determination was actually modified in response to this. So. Um, we subsequently withdrew that portion of our permit request and um, 
With that, we have a coastal permit that does not include the 100 feet from intersection prohibition, and we have an ordinance that includes it. So to um, reduce any confusion and to not have different rules inside and outside the coastal zone, we're just proposing that we eliminate that provision as shown here. Next slide. Thank you. Um, second, um, when we drafted this ordinance, um, we were taking into account the CZU fire, and um, we uh, put in a provision that said um, there may be emergency declarations that um, necessitate people residing in their vehicles, in their oversized vehicles, on our public streets. And um, that is, is still the case. Um, however, um, the council is also aware that we have situations where emergencies do not affect um, the need to suspend the oversized vehicle ordinance um, uh, implementation. For example, right now, we are in a declared state of emergency related to the January storms. And we're continuing that emergency declaration um, because we're looking for um, uh, FEMA and FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, reimbursements. Um, and um, as a result, we do not have any um, impacts resulting from those storms on the need to have people living in their vehicles in the streets. So we're looking at amending that provision to recognize that there are some emergencies where um, we would want to suspend the implementation of this ordinance, but other emergencies, that is not the case, as is the case with the storms where no individuals were actually displaced. So. Um, we are proposing that instead of um, any time an emergency is in effect, that the, um, uh, the oversized vehicle ordinance is not implemented. We're proposing that 10 days following the initiation of an emergency declaration that the oversized vehicle ordinance is suspended in terms of its enforcement. And then the city council or the city manager can evaluate that to see if there is good cause to extend the, um, the uh, termination of the uh, implementation of the enforcement. And finally, um, residential parking permit changes um, came to our attention as we began to look at the implementation of the ordinance, um, really in light of the fact that um, contractors um, could get permits pursuant to the ordinance um, to park overnight, but the way the code was written, um, it would not allow oversized vehicles to get um, residential um, parking permits during the, for during the daytime. So they could park at night, but not during the day, um, which seemed um, in <laughs> consistent with what the council <laughs> was intending. Um, and um, that would also be treating parking different um, in residential permit parking zones versus non-permit parking zones. So you could park in oversized vehicle during the day, not in a residential permit parking area, but um, you couldn't in that residential permit parking area. So we're proposing to modify this and clarify that you can still get a permit for an oversized vehicle in residential permit parking zones, um, but that does not entitle you to, that in and of itself does not entitle you to um, parking between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m you still need to get that separate oversized vehicle parking permit for the midnight to 5 a.m. Um, in order to have your vehicle parked during that time. And that concludes the presentation. Actually, one other point that I wanted to make. Um, we did coordinate all three of these changes with the California Coastal Commission. They had no issues with these. It does not affect the coastal permit that they recently approved for the implementation of this ordinance. No changes are needed to the coastal permit. And so we're available for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Let me ask if there are questions, comments, Mr. Butler. Mr. Butler, while people might be teeing those up, a couple of things. Thank you very much. And thank you. I understand there were council members who also assisted at the Coastal Commission with regard to providing direct testimony. Uh, I think we should be thankful and grateful to our uh, coastal commissioner from Santa Cruz who uh, was uh, 
paying very, very close attention to this issue helped us, I think, uh, a great deal in navigating through through the Coastal Commission uh, process. Uh, your team was, was quite good on this as well, and thank you for all the very fine work that you've done on it. Of course, thank you. Thank you. It's definitely a, a team questions effort. Or comments. No questions, comments. Let me see if there are members of the public who wish to comment on this item. Good afternoon. Hi, Joy Schendel Decker. Um, as you all know, I'm one of the co founders of Santa Cruz Cares, and we've been really involved following OVO for years. Um, and communicating with the Coastal Commission about it. And the main concern that we have with this agenda item is that the Coastal Commission um, basically, in our view, said that there needs to be a stakeholder group and that we should be part of it as well as the ACLU and people who are affected by um, living in their vehicles. And so far, we have not been contacted to be a part of a stakeholder group, and there are changes being made. I understand that the technicality is that the changes are being made to city code, not to the coastal permit, but they, they, you know, they fit together. So if there's something complex happening in city code that relates to OVO about emergency declarations and only having 10 days of, of uh, reprieve after an emergency, as a stakeholder, I would say that doesn't sound like enough. And um, in terms of the daytime permit and the nighttime permit, I understand trying to clean up some stuff that, that doesn't quite gel or it contradicts. But again, it seems a little complex, unnecessarily complex, to have people who are on the waiting list for a, a safe parking space to have to get both a daytime residential permit and an OVO waiting list nighttime midnight to 5 a.m. permit. So as a, as a person who feels that I should be already a stakeholder in this process and the communications with uh, on, on everything about this, um, you know, I would like to see that happen really like now. Um, even when these little sort of cleaning up fiddly things are happening. Um, I, I believe that is, would fulfill the spirit of, of cooperation and consensus building around OVO instead of a kind of continuation of an oppositional and conflictual thing where we feel like we need to, to push back in order to advocate uh, for people. We, we would really much rather cooperate uh, from the beginning Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, Reggie here from Santa Cruz Cares. Supposed to be one of the stakeholders, but as uh, Joy sort of alluded to, this feels like kind of yet another situation where the city is lacking transparency, lacking cooperation. Um, I understand, obviously, modifying the daytime, that was part of the revised findings at the Coastal Commission. You guys probably on council haven't been following this <laughs> to this level of detail. But when the city applied for their coastal permit, these changes were not in OVO. And these changes, except for the daytime removal, were not in the coastal permit. So we have two changes here uh, regarding the exemption of uh, declaration of state of emergency and the other one about the daytime parking permit which are being made after the permit was granted and then trying to be retroactively applied to both the city and the coastal zone and the stakeholders, Santa Cruz Cares, ACLU, service providers, unhoused, whoever else, right, were not brought in to give any feedback because we would love to make minor changes to OVO. If you guys are making minor changes to OVO, Count us in, right? I would love to get rid of the detached trailer clause, which hurts Blue, downtown streets team member, unnecessarily. He's not an oversized vehicle or uh, oversized vehicle, and he can move it with a bicycle. He doesn't get uh, 
stuck in an inoperability situation. And so you can imagine the frustration that we've gone through this whole process. And I'm not going to litigate history here, but obviously, like, in, in case you guys don't remember, the city was ticketing people for unpermitted coastal parking signs while knowing they were unpermitted for at least the last five years. They were towing people off of those signs. They then, after we got them removed, tried to restripe all parking in that area based on a coastal permit that was not allowed to do that. So, if I were in your position, I would either consider, as good faith, getting rid of the detached trailer clause, um, or uh, just do the daytime parking restriction change, because that's what you committed to in the coastal permit. Uh, if you want to do more changes, please include the stakeholders, do it at a future meeting, just make the process right, because it doesn't feel good. Um, I'll leave it at that. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? And who is online when you're ready? Good to go? Thank you. Person online, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, we're going to we'll come back to them maybe if they're there. Anybody else who's with us? We should make any comment? We got them again? There Are we you? go. Okay, good afternoon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, yes. Uh, I'm Robert Morris of Huff. Living in a vehicle, I guess anyone would agree, is better than living outside in a tent, and living in a tent in a community of tents beats hiding in the bushes, the green belt, or an alley or doorway in flight from the police. 120, 100 to 200 people had their tents bulldozed from nine last month, but we are now going backward. Now comes the OVO law with the cosmetic amendments. There's no place to go. There's no armory tier three parking for most. Very long waiting list. Almost twice as long as the number of spaces. Ask Kevin Morrison, the program manager. Gone by Don Lots on tier two were a nice fix up to get past the Coastal Commission, but the spaces aren't used or usable. Well, how about waivers to stop ticketing until parking spaces magically appear? Do the OVO amendments have any specifics or safeguards? Haven't seen them. We've seen the city's contempt for vehicles on Delaware, Schaefer, Swanton, and nearby streets with its phony no parking at night signs. Eager parapolice volunteers led by Deborah Elston, as Reggie Miser pointed out, falsely ticketed scores, if not hundreds, over the years. This in spite of weak objections from the local coastal enforcement authorities. We must hold in check city authorities subservient to West Side bigotry and real estate speculators. Only community power can stop this disastrous bulldozer. No general funds to continue this opportunistic storage program. No safeguards for the waiver program. A broken promise to the Coastal Commission. When dwindling COVID funding runs out, the answer will still be run them out of town, which is what the OVO is really all about. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Matters back before the council. Ms. Bruner? I have a question. You have a motion to make or a question? Okay, let's do the question first. Thank you. One, yeah, so, so my question is, um, uh, so I guess there's a community or a stakeholder group that has been, I, ha I haven't read all the conditions for the, with the Coastal Commission, but um, there's a stakeholder group that is to be um, involved in the process for implementing the, implementing the ordinance. Um, or maybe you could just explain and then um, help me understand where that's at. When would people be contacted to participate in those conversations and just to, to get a better sense of, of, I mean, we're hearing people say we're supposed to be on that committee and nobody called us. So just when, when might people get a call and what will they do? Thanks for that question, Councilmember Brown. 
Um, so as part of the um, coastal permit approval, one of the conditions was to um, bring together a stakeholder group with roughly equal representation of um, unhoused advocates and um, those dwelling in vehicles along with, um, on the other side, um, individuals who were proponents of the oversized vehicle ordinance. Um, we are coordinating with the Coastal Commission on um, the um, stakeholder group plan and um, we do anticipate um, reaching out to the um, stakeholders within likely a month um, and the and the plan is to have an initial meeting. The, the condition of approval requires um, at least four meetings over the course of the year. Uh, the plan is to have at least one of those meetings um, uh, at least a couple of weeks in advance of us doing the implementation and, and ideally a little bit more. We're, we're still working on the timing. We've got a lot of steps ahead of us before we can implement the ordinance itself. And this is one of those steps. Um, but. Um, within about a month, I would expect we will have that um, coordination with the Coastal Commission complete, and then we'll be reaching out to those stakeholders to schedule that first um, stakeholder group meeting. You're welcome. Let me ask you a quick question, uh, staying in that vein. Is, is there anything in the agreement that we have made with the Coastal Commission relative to the process you just described? which if we took our action today, the Coastal Commission would look and say, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't the order in which you had agreed to do this. We can take this action and still do those other things and be in compliance with the Coastal Commission's intent here as well as the letter of what they did in improving our ordinance. That's correct. We have coordinated with the Coastal Commission in advance of this meeting, and Coastal Commission did not have any concerns. They also saw that these changes are minor in nature. Thank you very much. Ms. Bruner, did you have a question? Or uh, were you ready for a motion? Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a comment, and, and um, uh, Council Member Brown did ask um, the question that I was going to comment on in that... Um, uh, the stakeholder meetings haven't begun yet, and I know that I've been asking as well, and city staff has been working closely with uh, Coastal Commission, and, and I just want everyone to know that um, we're learning as we go as well and kind of relying on Coastal Commission's direction in terms of um, these next steps with signage, with um, submitting um, outreach plans and all of that in the stakeholder group and meetings and all of that together will hopefully we can all work together um, and stakeholders um, being those that have um, recreational vehicles and those who live in their vehicles um, and uh, you know neighbors and and businesses you know so there's there's a wide variety of folks who have expressed interest and and we're at this point following coastal commission's um direction so i'm glad uh, director butler that you brought that up because i know i've also answered a couple of those questions as well regarding the stakeholder meetings when will they start and also we were looking geographically um as well for representation, so not just everyone on the west side, but everywhere through the Coastal Commission from the east side to the to the west side, wherever that lies in the city of Santa Cruz, the Coastal Commission stretches a geographical area. So, you know, looking at much as much as possible into that diverse representation so we can have transparency in making the best, um, uh, 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 path forward and my understanding with this is this is to align with the conditions of approval that the Coastal Commission just um, uh, voted on so these uh, tweaks to and updates um, will align and thank you for working with the Coastal Commission on these steps and I hope that we can keep communication um, and get something out so people who aren't listening or watching here know maybe we can post something on the bulletin board. Um, I know we have um, 
um, as soon as we know, we can let people know. So hopefully uh, some of the groups that are here with us today um, hear that and know that as soon as all of that starts coming together, we will be um, having, having those discussions and working together. Um, so with that, I would like to make a motion um, for item number 27 to introduce for publication an ordinance amending select portions of chapter 10.40 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code along with Santa Cruz Municipal Code section 10.41060 pertaining to the parking of oversized vehicles. There's a motion, is there a second? I'll second that. There's a second by Ms. Watkins under debate and discussion. You may open on your motion. <laughs> I have nothing further okay. than what I've already said other than I'm looking forward to the process going forward and thank you for coming today to um, speak and express your um, desire to partake in that and I think you know you spoke at the Coastal Commission um, there were people who spoke at the Coastal Commission hearing and those were names that were um, you know, considered for the stakeholder groups. And I'm sure there will be more names. So looking forward to that hopefully within the next month. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. Let's make a very brief set of comments here. I will not be supporting the motion. I do not support this oversized vehicle ordinance. I have been very clear about that. Um, and I don't support it for a variety of reasons I won't go into in detail. Um, some of it is related to the ethics of this, um, and some of it is related to the um, question of efficacy. And I believe that um, we are, the city is spending, um, you know, a considerable amount of resources doing a protracted gymnastics routine here to try to um, uh, make an ordinance uh, viable uh, or appear to be viable to, to uh, address a problem that we already have tools for. We can tow vehicles that are not, are not moving. We, there's, there's plenty of ordinance on the books. I've stated them all here and I'm not gonna do it again. Um, but I see this as a, you know, I think in, um, in the long run, uh, I'm, if I'm proved wrong, all right, um, it happens occasionally, <laughs> I admit. <laughs> um, but I believe that we are, we are just investing a tremendous amount of resources to try to accomplish something, one that I disagree with, but even if you agreed with it, um, that we're not gonna accomplish through this, um, this ordinance. And, and so, again, I, I'd like to, you know, and I'll keep watching <laughs> to see, and I'll keep watching how much money we spend um, to try to make this possible, but um, at this point, I can't, nothing has changed, and I can't support uh, the revisions because I don't support the ordinance. For the debate or discussion, clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. <clears throat> Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Council Member Kalantari Johnson absent. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Dewey? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. This will be back before us uh, for further consideration and readings at a later uh, council meeting. We are on item 28 on our regular agenda. This is a cooperative retail management business real estate improvement district assessment for the fiscal year 2024. Ms. Unit, good afternoon. And Ms. Lipscomb, good afternoon. This is, I will be stepping out for this item. Item number 28 re relates to my employment. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, there, there's another training that I might put out inside of the Right, Ms. Unit? Do I need to do Connie, presentation? I'll leave a model. You may sign them up for oh. a, short, a shorter version of the Eric. Good afternoon. 
uh, Rebecca Unit, Economic Development Manager, um, and uh, also staff support for the Downtown Management Corporation. Uh, here with my director, Bonnie Lipscomb, as well. Uh, so the item today is our cooperative retail management assessment. This is our annual renewal process for uh, the Downtown Management Corporation assessment. Uh, so just a brief agenda for you. We're going to review the process that we take to renew this every fiscal year, uh, the DMC annual plan, and then our uh, proposed DMC district expansion. Uh, so the typical time frame for this, uh, we renew the assessment on the fiscal year each year. Uh, because we're proposing some changes to the assessment, we did have an additional public notice uh, 40 day, 45 days in advance of the public hearing scheduled for June 27th. Um, today, we're here to adopt the resolution of intention to levy the assessment, um, as well as approve the work plan um, and an ordinance introduction as well. Um, and then following this meeting, we'll do additional public noticing to the DMC assessment payers uh, in uh, preparation for the June 27th public hearing to adopt the, um, the annual assessment. Uh, so some background on the Downtown Management Corporation and CRM assessment. It was established in 1994 as a property improvement district. Uh, the CRM district is uh, managed by the Downtown Management Corporation, uh, which has a board of directors with three property rep owner representatives, three business owner representatives, uh, two city council members, which are currently council members Newsom and Kalantari Johnson, as well as our economic development and housing director as the chief financial officer. Uh, just a brief overview of sort of the work plan of the Downtown Management Corporation. Um, they cover four main areas, cleaning, hospitality, outreach, and safety. The majority of the budget goes towards the Downtown Ambassador Program, uh, which is run through the Downtown Association, um, administered by Block by Block, which is a national uh, organization that facilitates these programs. Uh, we also have uh, another portion of our budget that goes towards the cleaning contract for downtown, so pet and human waste removal. Um, and then the service providers all really coordinate with the different um, downtown services in terms of uh, Santa Cruz Police Department, downtown outreach, mental health workers, um, and all the various amenities that help to create a safe and welcoming uh, environment in downtown. Uh, this year we do have some proposed changes to the assessment put forward by the board. Uh, we've put out to the property owners a uh, proposed increased assessment uh, for the current um, payers and then also an expansion of the district to include the properties fronting Front Street and Cedar Street um, to really encompass that whole downtown core. Uh, here's a map overview showing the existing district and the proposed expansion. So currently the district is serving Pacific Avenue and the side streets up to Cedar and Front. And so the proposal is to capture the properties along Cedar Street on both sides and Front Street on both sides to um, really round out that service delivery, uh, especially with the new development that we have coming online. Um, so the rates have stayed uh, flat over the last decade. We don't have a CPI adjustment built into this assessment. So that is a proposal going forward is to add that because um, costs for services have increased and uh, the city's actually been helping to supplement some of that. And so being able to bring these assessments to current rates um, and then plan for that to uh, keep pace over time going forward. Um, and then also with the expanded district and the expanded services, there are just those increased costs that we need to account for. Um, so our recommendation for you this afternoon uh, is to approve the fiscal year 23 uh, annual report and 24 plan um, to adopt the resolution of intention and to adopt a first reading of the ordinance um, if this increase and in expansion uh, does go into effect based on the ballots that we received. Um, any questions? Thank you so much. Are there questions by council members? Looking good. Okay. Thank you so much. Let me see if there are anybody online or with us today who wishes to make comment on this item. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We have nobody. We do not. Right. right. Matters back before. Move the recommendation. I'll Excuse move it. Me. I'll move the recommendation. Ms. Brown awesome. moves. Well. Vice Mayor seconds uh, the <laughs> staff recommendations one through three on page 28.1 of the council <laughs> packet. Debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Um, Councilmember Bruner, it, you disqualified herself. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Akili? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you very much for both of you for your good work on this. Let me
me just take a pause for here for a second. I just need to do a quick little bit of consulting here for a So anybody wondering what we were just doing, we were huddling to see uh, when we should take our, our late afternoon, early evening break. We do have quite a bit of work to still do today. So what we will do is we will go into recess between now and 4.30. We will come back precisely at 4.30 and take up the remainder of our work, which consists of adopting the annual budget and some related activities. So we will stand in recess until 4.30 p.m. The hour of 4.30 having arrived and gone, uh, we are back from our af late afternoon, early evening recess. Uh, we are on item 29.1, and this is the 2024 fiscal year proposed budget. Ms. Cabell, good afternoon again. Good to see you. Good afternoon. Elizabeth Cabell, Finance Director. Um, and we are looking at both 29.1 and 29.2, so we'll do both of them together. We had the um, budget hearings last month, two days of presentations and talks, so very little of that today. Um, we are all, all the directors are here to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and then we provided some input on concerns and issues that were raised during the budget hearing. Um, so we sent those out. There's also been a couple of things attached as FYIs. So, um, so basically today, we're re like I said, don't really have any sort of big presentation. Um, really just here to answer any questions, um, any issues, any concerns that you have. And at the end of that, there are three things that we would like to do. Um, next. My one slide is um, adopt the budget, um, amend the personnel complement, and accept the water commission's recommendations regarding the water department's um, operating and capital investment program. One thing to be aware of on 29.2, the personnel complement, it is correct in the proposed in the budget that you have, but in the resolution the, on the fire department, it says MA, it should be PMA. So that has been corrected. So when it is adopted, that will be the um, correct position, but just if you're looking through the resolution, it does look, yeah, it's um, yeah, corrected. So, so with that, I'll turn it over to you all if there are any questions, comments. Questions or comments of the staff? And what we'll do is, uh, we, we did, in case there are members of the public wondering, gee, why are there not <laughs> questions on your perhaps the most significant item you take action on every year. We did that. As the gentlelady pointed out, we had two days of such hearings. This is our formal action on the budget and reconciliation of various accounts and so on. So uh, don't, uh, if you are watching this, don't think that uh, we don't have questions about our budget. We spent two days with all that. So let me see if there are any clarifying questions or follow-up questions that folks have. All right, let me ask if, uh, if the public uh, wishes to comment on this, uh, let's see. Uh, please come on up. And while you're coming up, let me check with our clerk and see if we have folks online yet. Wait, Not yet. Okay. Good evening. How are you, sir? I'm well, thanks. Mayor Keeley and members of council, my name is Doug Engfer. I have the honor to work with the Water Department for the past 10 years or so, first on the WASAC and now as Vice Chair of the Water Commission. And as I near the end of my tenure on the commission. Uh, this is the last department budget. I'll have the opportunity to review in this capacity. So I wanted to take this opportunity to share some observations regarding progress, process, and values. Uh, first, progress. 
Over the past decade, the organization's culture of continuous improvement has yielded vastly increased organizational capacity, as reflected in the work product you recently reviewed, uh, but also in the broad sweep of the department's plans, goals, and achievements. Uh, we recently heard there are 30 to 40 ongoing projects right now in the CapEx program, which is amazing. Uh, second, as regards process, um, I'm inspired by and proud of the team's work. Uh, they pursue their work with clear eyes, integrity, and intellectual honesty, and review and adjust their assumptions to ensure a realistic view of the budget and the work ahead. Finally, as regards values, in the context of an overarching respect for environmental stewardship, the department focuses on delivering high-quality, safe product reliably, affordably, and sustainably, aware that they must earn the public's trust every day. Mindful of the long lifespan of water infrastructure, their financing strategy attends to generational equities, ensuring that costs are borne by those who benefit. And finally, they develop budget and attendant rates with a genuine concern for ensuring that low and fixed income customers can manage to an affordable cost. I'm pleased and proud to have been a small contributor to the process and support the commission's recommendation that council approve this budget. Thank you for your time and your service to our community. Well, don't go anywhere. Thank you for your service. Thank you. This is uh, a topic that is uh, right alongside public safety, obviously, for a municipal government. And people have to be just not even paying attention to it. They just they have the peace of mind to know when they turn that, it's all good. Water flows. And, uh, and that's no mean feat. And we complimented the water director during budget hearings uh, about how the department worked during the presidentially declared disaster when we had the Newell Creek pipe uh, breaking and sort of fixing the flat tire without stopping the car. I mean, it just was terribly impressive in, in an emergency. And the work that the Water Commission has done over the years and prior to my service on this, especially during 2022, uh, reviewing and sending forth a series of very important and effective public policy issues about how to deal with our water system going forward in the next few decades. Uh, the Water Commission has, has done great work in, in helping the city see through uh, a pathway to success. So thank you very much for your service on the commission, sir. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else who is with us today wishes to comment on it? On, on our budget items. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? <laughs> Matters back before the, the body. Is there a motion? Yes, I, I'll move the budget and personnel compliment. Second. Second. Second, lots of seconds. Uh, let's go, we're gonna go with, uh, we're gonna go with Ms. Brunner on the second on that. All right, let me see if there are Questions, comments, observations before we move to a vote. Seeing, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Okay. Um, uh, Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Uh, Brunner? Aye. And thank you. <laughs> Council Member Calentari Johnson is absent. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mary Keeley? All right. Motion passes and yeah, so thank ordered. You. Thank you all. Thank you. This is, uh, this is a, an important moment every year uh, as we close out one fiscal year and start another one. I'll say only this, that this is my, obviously my first year sitting in this capacity and hearing a budget uh, budget hearings, a couple of days of budget hearings, um, I will reflect on this, that this little government, as compared with state government or county government, this little government is so darn good, just so darn good. Uh, you look at any part of it, it's human scale, uh, whether it's the folks that we, by council manic organization, don't deal with folks, you know, down, beyond the first two layers, because that belongs to the city manager and the administration. But also, just for the first two layers that I deal with, it is uh, as good or better than anything I've ever seen in public life. 
uh, how well you work with each other, how much you like working with each other, how uh, the notions of uh, protecting silos and protecting jurisdictions in this little government gives way to cooperation, facilitation, seeing how uh, the greater good can be advanced. And I will say the responses uh, to the questions asked by council members during the budget hearings. Uh, the questions were intelligent and the responses were equally as intelligent and informative and helpful. Uh, I, I look forward to the next fiscal year. Uh, I think that the way that the city management gave you direction on how to put your individual department budgets together for this coming year there were a lot of ways you could have done that. There were a lot of ways you could have worked on what are the assumptions, the planning assumptions going forward in the next 12 months. I think you made an exceptionally good decision, Mr. City Manager, with your team about what the framing around the budget would be. And uh, thank you all for living within that framework. Uh, this is, uh, this. I, in my judgment, this is the single most important act any city council uh, takes each year is adopting the annual budget for the upcoming year. Uh, it, I, in my view, it exemplifies uh, all of your commitments to the finest in public service, in public services, in integrity, the way you approach your work, the way you work collaboratively with your subordinates. Uh, they are not some other class of people. They are the people that help make this government work every day, whether it's the fire department or anybody else, any other department of this government. So thank you all so terribly much for uh, a thoughtful, intelligent, appropriate uh, budget, set of budget presentations and assumptions. And I think I speak for the council in saying we look very much forward to working with you in the new fiscal year. Thank you all very, very much. Did we take the, uh, we took 29.1 and 29.2, the action was consolidated, we are finished with that. This is the opportunity under oral communication for anyone to address the council on a matter under our jurisdiction but not on today's agenda. None of you, please, thank you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Look, they're all rising to come talk in oral communication. Sir, are you here for oral communication? <laughs> I am. I think I'm a little late to the game. I'm new oh, to this. No, you're good. Come on. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, nice to meet you. My name is Sean Williamson. I'm here uh, about agenda item number 20, the uh, resource recovery collection rates increase. Um, so let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. We're just going to have to switch this up a little bit. So the way your oral communication works is it's on any item under our jurisdiction, not on today's agenda. But here's what I'm going to do, because that, that's sort of the rules for oral communication. Okay. But since we took this item up before you were here, as, an, as a courtesy, please make your remarks. Thank you. I was watching online and ran down here at that moment. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so I own a small composting business here in Santa Cruz. I've been working with other business owners and those involved in uh, community composting in conjunction with the city's Department of Resource Recovery to help create a more favorable atmosphere so the businesses like mine and others can help um, process the immense amount of organic, mat organic material that gets created here every day. Mm -hmm. We have been advised that collections rate increases are the most opportune time to augment restrictive city code. And that is why I'm here today. In short, we are looking for receptive city council members to help us move towards a model that is at the same time beneficial to the city and its ratepayers, local small business, and the health of our soil and natural systems here in Santa Cruz. If this resonates with anyone, we would love to work with you ahead of the hearing on August 8th to come up with some verbiage everyone can agree upon to bring our community composting organizations into the fold to work in harmony with the city to help tackle the ever-growing dilemma and expense that processing organic material in the correct way represents. So essentially, in layman's terms, what we're talking about is businesses being able to contract with other businesses to, to process organic material. The way the city code is written now, it's not feasible. And so we're looking to hopefully make a space for businesses such as mine and others. Thank you. 
and remind me, just so I'm clear, you this was on item 20. number 20. 21. 20. I'm just two sorry. zero. 20. Thank you very much. Yeah, resource recovery yeah. collection rates right. increase. Thank you. Please. There was an offer made. Do, are yeah. you, have you uh, sent a message to council members? Will we see your contact info in our inboxes? Could yes. We, okay. Yes. We'll, uh, so we're we working to come up way. with a proposed verbiage and then start working with you guys. But just Great. wanted to put a face to the name before you see an email. So, Very good. time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very much appreciated. Have a nice evening, sir. Is there further business to come before us? Further business, Ms. Bush? Anybody online? With deep reluctance, the vice mayor moves <laughs> to adjourn, and uh, Council Member Watkins, also with deep regret and reluctance, seconds the motion, non-debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post motion carries. Aye.